Hello everybody and welcome to the first virtual and 37th annual International Churchill Conference. I'm Alan Packwood and I'm going to be your host for today. The conference is entitled Churchill in Adversity and it marks 80 years since the Battle of Britain and the Blitz. But it is also, of course, taking place against the backdrop of a global pandemic. Consequently, it is the first, and we hope last, to be held purely online. And although a few of us have made it here to Churchill College, many, in fact most, of our speakers will be joining us remotely. So bear with us if along the way we encounter the odd technical glitch. All will be well, as we've got an excellent team working hard behind the scenes to keep us on air. This event could not be happening without the support of our members and donors, and we thank you all. But we want to thank you, our global audience, for tuning in. We've been thrilled to see so many registrations. The latest figures put us close to 2,800. And we would particularly like to welcome all those who are new to our organisation. And of course, those in different time zones. If you're getting up early for this, then I hope you've got plentiful supplies of tea and coffee. If you're staying up late, then perhaps something stronger. But in all cases, welcome. We've got a packed agenda for the next two days, four hours of programming each day from 2 to 6 p.m. British Standard Time. The programme can be accessed via the programme button on the conference homepage. And you can see, if you look at that, that we're going to be travelling through time and space. Today's sessions focus on leadership, on painting, and on legacy. The speakers button will give you more information about who is appearing and when. Let me just quickly take you through some of the other buttons on your screen. If you want to ask a question of any of our panelists, then please use the ask a question button to email to 2020 at winstonchurchill.org. And we also hope that you'll be using social media um, to ask questions. Um, but if you do, make sure you come back to this main screen. We want to make your experience as interactive as possible, which is why we're going to be interspersing the serious debate with quiz questions. So clicking the take the quiz button when prompted by me or scrolling down will take you to an interactive screen where you can click on your choice of answer and see how many people are voting the same way as you in response to the questions we ask. Alternatively, you can just shout at the screen or you can print out our PDF and record your answers as we go along. Most of the questions we're going to be asking are for fun, for honour, but there will be some where you can email in for prizes, so do look out for those. Finally, if you want to support the work of the International Churchill Society in staging events like this, then do show your appreciation by clicking on the Donate button at the top of the menu. But again, make sure you come back and watch what's going on. We're a, a charity, a non-profit, and any monies received will be going to support our ongoing educational projects, of which you will be seeing and hearing more over the course of the next two days. But without further ado, let's start our first session. And again, don't forget to email in your questions, 2020 at winstonchurchill.org. Churchill is often held up as an exemplar of strong leadership. But what is it really like to lead in adversity? I'm delighted that we have two very senior and well-known British politicians to discuss this. And here, to introduce them, to set the context for this session, is the man who has done more than any other to make today possible and to sustain the work of the International Churchill Society, our chairman, Mr. Lawrence Geller. Lawrence, welcome to the stage. Thank you, Alan. Uh, welcome to our conference. And please know how thrilled I am to be here at Churchill College, Cambridge, the home of the Churchill Archive Centre. And I thank you for being part of this conference. It's an unusual one, but it is the largest audience that we've ever had at any of our conferences. Nearly 3,000 people. 
That said, after over two decades of my speaking at these conferences, I can't see anyone. And I, I truly have to tell you, I, admit, I miss the incredible collegiality and friendship our meetings always engender. It, uh, it's odd not to have a physical audience, but I now, I'm, I'm hopeful and anticipate that next year I'll be welcoming many of you to London for our next conference. There's a silver lining to everything and there's no less for this pandemic. And that's forced the International Churchill Society to embrace technological change. Hard for me personally. There's something for which there's plenty of Churchill precedence. After all, this was the man whose intense curiosity about technology and science led him in the 20s to say, might not a bomb no bigger than an orange be possible? May, we not, may it not possess a secret power to blast a, a township at a stroke? This man championed technology in ships, submarines, planes. He even took to the cockpit himself in an age when it was incredibly dangerous. He was the first occupant of 10 Downing Streets to have a scientific advisor. From his famed involvement in the development of tanks to having the first hotline to the United States, he was always ahead. And then, of course, there was Bletchley. As he said, the goose that laid the golden egg and never cackled. His scientific curiosity never wavered. And in his old age, he established the Churchill College, Cambridge, where we are today, to train scientists and technologists. Well, having taken our, our operation now online, I'm confident we can build, build on the success of this endeavor, these two days of endeavors. And we can do so much more. And by doing so, we can expand our reach even further while embracing far greater diversity and demographic segments of our audience. Next year's conference, as Alan said, will be physical, but also virtual. I'd like to thank all of those that have worked so hard to get us to this point. The conference and operating committees, there was Andy Smith, Scott Johnson, Derek Greenwell, Catherine Carter in the UK, Justin Reich, David Freeman, uh, Mitchell, uh, Mitchell Rice, Tim Riley, Craig Horn, and Lee Pollock in the US, John Olson, irrepressibly in Australia, and our producer Charlotte Oldwood and her production team from Wave FX, but particularly uh, to the amazing Alan Packwood, to whom all Churchillians will forever owe a debt. You'll be seeing many of these people on your screens over the course of the next two days, but their gener generosity of heart and spirit will never, ever, ever go amiss. But here I want to pause and acknowledge a sad loss of, sad loss of one of our organisation. Just last week, we lost our friend Paul Courtney. He was a former long-serving chairman and honor honorary secretary of ICS UK. He was a member of the Finest Hour editorial board, a generous proofreader par excellence to so many Churchill public publications. Paul served this nation in its army for 35 years and for the Churchill Society almost as long. Paul was a wise man, a great Churchillian, the quintessential gentleman. He will be much missed, but never ever forgotten. As Alan mentioned, we're a non-profit organization dedicated to preserving Churchill's memory and promoting his legacy. And we constantly strive to demonstrate how his, the, the wide swath of loss, lessons from his life are so relevant and so important in today's world. And we do so through supporting education, historical research, heritage projects, fostering public speaking, leadership, imagination, public service, and by encouraging robust and impartial de debate, never fearing to acknowledge the good and bad of history. I'd like to thank all of our sponsors, but especially Gretchen Kimball, Ron and Eleanor Luke, Robert and Regina Mulhauser, and John Paul and Isabel Montupé. So, one pitch, there's still time to donate and add your name to this illustrious list. 
We're a non-profit organization and we're dedicated to programs like this. So your help is appreciated because we really do believe that if you give us the tools, we will finish the job. But now to start the job, we couldn't hope for a better beginning. The theme of the conference, Churchill University says it all. When we came up with this title, we didn't know quite how much adversity we'd be facing. And it's been a roller coaster of a year, juxtaposing key World War II dates with COVID and, of course, the statues controversy. As a result, Churchill has hardly ever been out of the news. And we know that he relished nothing more than being at the heart of fast-moving events, and he thrived in adversity. In the words of General Alan Brooke, in a real crisis, he was always at his best and stood all of the heavy shocks without flinching. So it's that spirit that takes us to this conference. And several fascinating sessions will look at Churchill's relevance and legacy. But before we look forward, we have to look backwards and acknowledge the huge sacrifices made in the Second World War. As Alan mentioned, this is the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Britain and the Blitz. And our original conference program would have seen us honoring the few in the RAF club and celebrating the spirit of the Londoners in the Guild Hall. But now, wartime phrases like, we're all in it together and keep calm and carry on, have suddenly acquired more current resonance. Maybe not only we, but so many in leadership positions throughout the world are getting vivid and fresh insights into how difficult it was for Churchill to walk with destiny and lead in times of a long-lasting global crisis. Perhaps people now, these leaders today, realize that real leadership is so much more than reacting to instant polls and ad hoc decision making. How to lead in adversity is surely part of Churchill's legacy. So we obviously have to start with a discussion on leadership. And this is a conversation was we were originally going to stage in partnership with RUSI, the Royal United Service Institutes of June of this year. And I'm so delighted that Karen von Hippel, RUSI's incredible Director General and her board, have let us run with it today. They are the world's largest independent think tank on defense and security, and an essential and integral part of this nation. Clearly, they are the perfect partners for us. So it's my pleasure today to introduce two men that I've got to know over the years, and for whom I share with so many others the greatest admiration and respect. Not only have they spent their lives as dedicated servants of this nation, but each represents the very best of British qualities. Both Sir John Major and Lord Haig stand in the footsteps of Sir Winston Churchill. Both are fine Churchillians. They both served in the highest offices of British state, and they've both been leader of the Conservative Party. And let me tell you, both are true leaders. So long introductions seemed unnecessary, as they're both, un uh, both well known to you. Sir John, was British Prime Minister from 1990 to 1997, but prior to that he'd already served his country as Chief Secretary of the Treasury, Foreign Secretary and Chancellor of the Exchequer. As Prime Minister, he was responsible for re responding to the end of the Cold War, the First Gulf War, Gulf War, conflict in Bosnia, and for initiating the processes that led to peace in Northern Ireland. Since leaving the Commons, he has remained a hugely influent, influential and listened to voice in recent public debates on devolution and on Brexit. William Hague served under John as Secretary of State for Wales before, Wales before becoming leader of the Conservative opposition from 1997 to 2001 and Foreign Secretary from 2010 to 2014. I got to know Lord Hague when he was Chairman of RUSI and must tell you that he boldly led that institution to a new dimension of excellence to the benefit of the nation. Not only is he a student of Churchill, but like him is both a practitioner of history and a chronicler, having written on William Pitt the Younger and William Wilberforce. Now, we want you to join in at home 
uh, by emailing your questions and taking part in the interactive, qu interactive quiz. So I hope you enjoy the conference. Learn, be inspired, and importantly participated, participate not only this time, but in the many and varied Churchill events we have coming up through in the, in the, in the next few months. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Sir John and Lord Haig to initiate the discussion. Thank you very much. Enjoy the conference. Well, thank you very much, Lawrence, and I hope everybody can see and hear me. Uh, this is William Haig. I'm speaking to you from Wales, indeed, and it's a personal pleasure to support anything in which Lawrence Geller is involved and, and to pay tribute to his leadership of the ICS, and a great pleasure, of course, to be even doing it virtually to be in conversation with my old boss and mentor, Sir John Major. Um, now, I should explain, uh, just to show how seriously I take everything he says, uh, that when he appointed me Secretary of State for Wales in 1995, a country I didn't know very well at the time, uh, he said, he gave me a simple instruction. He said, I want you to take Wales to your heart. And here I am, 25 years later, sitting in my home in Wales with a Welsh wife and a lot of Welsh books. And so I take his instructions really seriously. And it's a great pleasure, of course, to talk about the lessons of, of Churchill in adversity. And, and Churchill once said uh, that there's one thing worse than fighting with allies, and that's fighting without allies. He probably had General de Gaulle in mind in particular, but he was mainly talking about the United States. Uh, and the long effort that he had made uh, to bring America into support for, for Britain in the war and then to influence American policy, even taking up residence in the White House at times to make sure that he influenced Roosevelt. And John Major and I, John, you and I have both worked a lot on that American relationship in modern times. You had a most exceptional friendship with the first President Bush and worked closely with President Clinton. Uh, I worked closely with the other Clinton, with Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, when I was Foreign Secretary. We both thought we could start this conversation talking about how we manage that relationship, what we need from it, uh, what we expect of it. Uh, so let me turn it over to you to, to develop that theme. Well, William, thank you very much indeed, and thank you for that introduction to our conversation. If I can go back to your remarks about Wales, I can only say I only wish everybody I'd worked with had taken so literally the advice I had given them. It would have made my political life an awful lot easier had they done so. Um, let me say a word about America and the relationship. Uh, my father was brought up in America. He was a Victorian man born in 1879. I was something of a late arrival. He was 64 when I was born. And he taught me that providing the United States and the United Kingdom were on the same page then in his view, the world was by and large in good hands. And that's rather an arrogant thing to say about Western nations. But the alliance with the United States is absolutely crucial, not just to the United Kingdom, but to the West as a whole, and even more widely. In our world these days, we need a nation effectively that leads. The only nation with the economic and political power to do that, economic political and military power to do that, is the United States. So it's important not just for them, not just for the UK and the United States, but for a far wider field, for the United States to be outward looking and to lead, because they can bring together the whole of Europe and beyond to face communal perils, whether they may be, uh, for example, the COVID peril we, state, uh, we face now, or military or political perils as well. So I regard the relationship with the United States as being extraordinarily important. And I learned that very vividly uh, from George Bush 41, when he brought together that remarkable coalition for the Gulf War. It was the greatest coalition that had been brought together since the Second World War. It was essentially his coalition as President of the United States and it worked brilliantly. So I am a huge advocate of our relationship with the United States, crucial to us, but crucial, I think, on a far wider sphere as well. 
I, I absolutely agree with, <clears throat> agree with that, John. And would you join me in, in thinking about the role of the United States in international institutions? Uh, because, of course, in Churchill's time, in the interwar years, when Churchill was, was warning against the dangers of, <clears throat> of new international conflict, the United States had withdrawn into isolationism and uh, didn't take part in the League of Nations, which was, of course, a, a first proposed by President Woodrow Wilson, but the, but the US Senate uh, voted against that. And that weakened the international system at the time. And I think there is a parallel today in that, in my experience, first of all, as you, as you say, in my experience uh, in international diplomacy, unless the United States is chairing a meeting and leading the way and making proposals, it's very hard for other Western nations to coalesce around a policy. But the institutional comparison is we now need the United States to be taking the lead in setting the rules of international trade and technology in the future, um, making sure that it's playing a big role in international negotiations on climate change, such as at, at the COP26 here in Britain next year. Um, in the World Health Organization, uh, we need the United States at the forefront of these things. Um, I, I think from what you're saying, you very much agree with that as well. Well, I'd go a little further than that. I mean, I entirely agree with that. But if you recall, it was at the, if I remember rightly, the San Francisco Opera House that the United States led people into the post-war reconstruction, the post-war settlement that began with the United Nations and, of course, subsequently World Health Organization, World Trade Organization, though that was a little later, and other bodies of that sort. Now, that was a remarkable piece of leadership, America stepping out into the world, bringing the world together in a way it had not been before to deal with collective problems. Now, that was a wonderful uh, philosophy, a wonderful inspiration. It has fallen, in many ways, short of the aspirations that were set at the time. And it does seem to me that the uh, post-war settlement now needs updating. It doesn't need scrapping. It needs changing, updating, and made more relevant. Certainly at the United Nations, I think the composition of the Security Council is plainly out of date now. And the single nation veto clearly inhibits much of what the United Nations was set up to do and should do. Uh, the World Trade Organization is now hampered in part because of the United States and has no dispute resolution uh, mechanism at the present time. And the Health Organization is under attack underfunded and underregarded, and yet with the pandemic we can see how important it is. But here's the question that arises. Who is big enough and powerful enough to bring people together to update those organisations? And it can only be done either by the United States, essentially by the President of the United States, or conceivably by the amalgamation of the members of state within the European Union but predominantly it can't happen without America. And that is why I say they're so critical. And it is crucial that they step out, look at these things and bring them up to date because if it doesn't happen, the world will continue to splinter and we will lose the dispute resolution mechanisms that exist in these various bodies that are so crucial to ending disputes. And I think that is something that ought to be a priority aim for future American administrations and for the leaders of Europe as well. So this is something that is um, a constant, really, in recent decades, through, through from Churchill to our own experiences, this, um, the vital nature of the relationship with America and the British relationship with America. And I think we can be sure whoever wins the presidential election in 10 days' time, Boris Johnson will be making every effort to be very close to them and work with them closely. But there are other vital aspects of international relations which have changed dramatically over that time. Of course, uh, Churchill really announced the beginning of the Cold War with his famous phrase in the speech at Fulton, Missouri, 1946, that an iron curtain had descended mm -hmm. across the continent of Europe. Uh, you, John, were prime minister when the curtain dissolved, when it actually, it fell down. Um, and that Cold War came to an end. And we've been through so many ups and downs of our relationship with Russia. 
Um, Churchill at one time said he, he wanted to strangle Bolshevism in its cradle um, and supported military actions in Russia in um, 1920 again, against the, the Bolsheviks at the, uh, after the revolution. Then by the 1940s, he was sending vast aid to Russia through the Arctic convoys uh, against a common enemy in, in Nazi Germany. Um, then through the, we went through the Cold War, and then I think you probably had the high point of relations with Russia, um, with, uh, with Boris Yeltsin. Um, Putin came afterwards. David Cameron and I dealt with, uh, with Putin and made many efforts. We, we made a concerted effort 10 years ago to improve relations with Russia. Um, but that once again, the, the boulder we rolled up the hill once again, slid down it, uh, rolled down it again, because Russia does see the world in a different way uh, from us. So um, what's your perspective on, on that and the, anything about those Yeltsin years that you would like to share with us? Uh, I, I remember firstly the high aspirations, the enormous hopes we had following the collapse of the Soviet Union. It did generally seem at the time that there was a new world to be made once the Soviet Union had gone. And that there was an opportunity, sadly misguided as we subsequently later saw, to spread the extent of uh, democracy and Western values to other parts of the world. We were over-ambitious in, uh, in seeking to do that. But it did at that moment look as though the world was in the business of being remade. And I think we, uh, we have a more... Uh, deeper understanding of the problems that uh, face doing that sort of thing after subsequent events. But it was a, a remarkable time. I remember George Bush Sr. talking of a new world order. And that new world order, in the way that he envisaged it, frankly hasn't come about. Now, I think we made a huge mistake with Russia in the early uh, 90s. After Gorbachev had been replaced by Yeltsin, um, both Gorbachev and subsequently Yeltsin asked for a great deal of help, financial help from the West, particularly as Yeltsin tried to move away from their traditional system to a more free market capitalist based system. And we denied them the resources that they asked, uh, asked for at the time that may have helped their economy escape many of the horrors they faced in the 1990s. And I think in retrospect, that was a mistake. Because as a result of that, when, Putin le uh, when, uh, when uh, Yeltsin left, we had Putin. And Putin was from the KGB. It seems to me you can take him out of the KGB, but not the KGB out of him. And ever since the collapse of the Soviet Union, the arrival of Putin, there has been a difficult relationship. When empires collapse, it is difficult. Russia seems ever keen to try and poke a stick in the eye of Uncle Sam. It's always keen to try and illustrate that it still matters in the world, even though the present Russia is infinitely less economic and militarily powerful than was the old Soviet Union. And so the relationship has been very poor, and you've seen it in the, the support for Belarus and Lukashenko, for example, more recently from Russia. Russia isn't, it seems to me, the enormous threat that once she, uh, that she was, that Churchill worried about so much in the 1930s. What she is, is a rogue nation, forever causing difficulty across Eastern Europe and elsewhere whenever she can for the West. But the bigger threat, I think, looking forward, is something that uh, Churchill didn't focus upon because it wasn't a threat at the time, and that is China, where the threat is potentially a good deal wider than anything that Russia might do today. Well, let's come on to China. As you say, um, Churchill never had to deal with China as a great power, um, although it was a beleaguered ally, of course, uh, in the war against Japan uh, in the 1940s. But he never had to deal with it as a great power. Now we do, of course, have to deal with it as a, a great power and a, a strategic adversary now, and uh, certainly in the view of, the, uh, of everyone in Washington. Uh, and many European leaders. And we should talk about what uh, this adversity for the world, if, if the world divides uh, between a, a Chinese bloc and a US bloc, 
uh, between Chinese technology and US technology. This will bring much new adversity uh, to, for leaders of the world. Um, now, my reflection on this is that the British government is right and the US government is correct, and many European governments to say we cannot be dependent on technology from China. We may welcome a great deal of trade and investment with China, but we can't be dependent on it. it it's, the, it's in the service of a vision of society fundamentally different from ours. Um, but I also say that we have to find a framework of working with China on global issues, um, that we can't solve the problem of future pandemics. We can't um, have new arms control agreements. Uh, we can't defeat climate change. We probably can't stabilize the world financial system. Without finding a framework of relations with China, even if we disagree with China about many things. Um, and I find the debate today is often too much one or the other. You know, you're either pro-China or you're anti-China. We have to find that right balance in foreign policy and make both parts work. Um, that's my perspective as a former foreign secretary, how, but how do you think about it? Well, broadly similar. <clears throat> I mean, if you consider the, the growth of China is the most fundamental change we've seen in the world for the best part of the last century. It is there, it is stable, it is continuing, it is not emphatically going to go away. And under the presidency of uh, uh, President Xi, China does seem to have changed much more towards uh, muscularity than, uh, than the free market. They've moved away from market reforms. They uh, are putting a great deal of economic credit into state-owned companies rather than the private sector, which had been happening before. They're being very assertive in Africa, the Middle East, but essentially in her neighbourhood around the South China Sea. And her power economically, uh, has become extraordinary. She now has a GDP broadly proximate to the United States, 11 times that of Russia, uh, four times that of the United Kingdom, two and a half times that or thereabouts of uh, Japan. Um, and that is an immense power, and it, it enables them to operate uh, economic power as well. And we mustn't forget that China also is developing a great deal in terms of military capability. Whereas Russia used to spend infinitely more on defence than China, China now spend infinitely more on defence than Russia, and I think probably now have a larger navy than the United States. So I'm not suggesting they're going to be an aggressive power, I'm suggesting that we would be silly to take our eye off what is actually happening in China. Now, we don't wish to regard China as an adversary. Of course, the art of statesmanship is to reach an accord with people with whom you have many differences, as we do plainly on market reforms and democracy. China isn't a democracy and shows no sign of becoming one. But we do have to find a modus operandi. We do need to discuss with China the areas where we can work together. But we do also need to show to China that where we, they and we disagree, we are not backward in stating our position and to make it clear that we take a different view and that there is a limit beyond which we will not tolerate an adverse view. You see that in microcosm at the moment, for example, in Hong Kong. I uh, used to work in Hong Kong as a very young man. I know Hong Kong quite well. I've travelled to it many times in the last uh, uh, 50 years. And yet the deal that China signed up to with Margaret Thatcher's government about Hong Kong is not being kept. We no longer have one country, two systems. We have one country, one system, and people are required to do what Beijing says they must do. And clearly, we need to make our disagreement with that felt it's, I hate to use the expression kowtowing. No one should kowtow to China. They are a great power. We have to acknowledge that. But it is important that we do not lose sight of our own Western values in the way in which we deal with China. So I am perhaps more hawkish on that subject than I am on most in terms of international affairs. 
So uh, what do you see, John, as the, as the appropriate vehicle globally for that Western um, unity and, and message? Uh, some people say that the G7 should develop into the, the D10. Um, that you take the, the G7, those leading um, Western democracies, you invite uh, South Korea, Australia, and India to join in a, an alliance of democracies. Of course, it doesn't have to be 10. We can all think of other countries we can add to that. Um, I often think when people suggest this, well, yes, India would be a very valuable part of that. Um, but India will always have its own distinctive foreign policy. It isn't easily drawn into a, a grouping of that kind. Um, but uh, do you see that kind of thing, given that you had seven year, more than seven years experience of the G7, you chaired the G7, can you see that kind of grouping as a vehicle to coordinate the, the approach of democratic nations? It sounds like the sort of thing Churchill would be, would be very much in favor of, of course, a, a, a grouping of democratic nations mm. in the world. Is, is that now a viable aspiration in the next few years? I think it depends how it works. I mean, uh, in the years that I uh, attended the G7, it met infrequently. The original idea that the leaders met on their own and talked exactly freely soon fell apart. The media demanded to know what the agenda was, demanded to know what was discussed, demanded to know what the outcome was. And it destroyed the, the, the original idea that the leaders could get together, talk privately, see if they could form a coalition uh, upon issues. That fell away and it became a pre-scripted media event I hope that is not too unkind. Now, I do think we need international cooperation. It must inevitably involve America and Europe, and I hope the United Kingdom as well. Now we have divorced ourselves uh, from Europe. But I am more concerned about the capacity it has to meet and reach decisions and argue in private without international fusses being evident than it being a formal grouping. But when there are dilemmas and difficulties, we need a coordinated view between those, uh, those three blocks, ourselves, uh, the United Kingdom, the European Union, and, um, and of course, the United States. I'm open-minded about the form it should take. I am concerned that there is that unity of view to deal with a whole range of problems, not just China, but certainly China, in order that the Western democratic ideals that are so dear to us are not lost either upon the rest of the world, where many of them perhaps would wish to uh, adhere to them, and certainly not lost amongst ourselves in how we deal with those problems. So I'm open-minded about what the structure is. I simply think we need to seek the agreement. Now, in a few minutes, I know we have to turn things back to Alan to, um, to have questions from um, around the world. Um, but I thought there was one other thing um, we could, we could finish off on in our conversation, which would bring in any wider lessons of, of leadership in adversity. And you and I have definitely experienced leadership in adversity in, in uh, many different ways. Um, but, um, and this is the subject of Ireland, um, linking it back to Churchill again, uh, not exactly a fan of Irish nationalism, Churchill, although he, was, um, he took part in supporting partition and peace with Ireland in the, in the early 1920s. Um, and then, of course, we went through a, a very difficult period again in the late 20th century, um, including terrorism on the, on the mainland of Britain, as well as in Northern Ireland, when you were prime minister. And you were absolutely instrumental in leading the change towards a peace process in Northern Ireland that has, that has borne important fruit uh, over time. What are the lessons of, of leadership in adversity from that or, or anything else you want to bring in before we, we go over to wider questions? Well, I simply remark in starting that our adversity these days, whatever it may be, is not remotely comparable to the adversities that Churchill faced, either in parts of, the, of his time in the First World War or certainly in the first year of his premiership in the war, where the adversity piled in day after day in the most extraordinary way. So in no sense do I compare the difficulties you and I faced or anybody else with those remarkable changes. I think what I would really say about Ireland is this, because it is a lesson for China and a lesson for Russia. 
you cannot reach an agreement with people with whom you disagree unless you understand why they disagree, what is the historical basis of it, and what is it they are seeking. Unless you understand and can put yourself in their mind, you are not properly equipped to negotiate an outcome. And I remember in Ireland, it's a very complex uh, system. Many of the frustrations that caused the Irish uh, uh, problems lay back very deep in history. So I think the only real point I would make, just two points. One, you need to understand the thinking of the people with whom you are dealing. And a particular point on Ireland, very pertinent to now, with the argument about the uh, protocol on Ireland and the possibility of a land border. It was at a land border on the island of Ireland that violence first began again in the 1960s when customs officers were murdered. So the argument about the protocol, the argument about the land border, is not an abstract argument between uh, Remainers in Europe and Brexiteers in Europe. It is a very practical argument about what could happen if our policy is misdirected on the subject of Ireland today. Well, on that very powerful point, I think we should um, pass on our conversation to, to the capable hands of Alan, who is going to see what questions have been developing to us while we have been talking. So, Alan, over to you. Thank you, William. Um, well, I have to say the questions have been rolling in from around the world, and um, Wayne is obviously up very early in Florida. Um, and his question is to both of you, and it is this. In the midst of the challenges you faced during your political life, did you ever discuss with your colleagues or ask yourself, what would Churchill have done in my shoes? Sir John, do you want to take that first? Uh, I did, yes. I mean, if you sit in the cabinet room at number 10, uh, Churchill go Churchill's ghost is an ever-present reality. So, yes, I did. Um, we were just talking ab about Ireland. And I did remember Churchill's role in Ireland. I did remember a famous speech he made, I think it was on St George's Day 1933, when he was essentially talking about the English, but referred to the other parts of the United Kingdom and vaguely disparagingly referred to his fondness for Ireland but also to the ugly mask it sometimes wore, by which he meant the nationalist violence. So yes, one did occasionally think of what it was he might have done. And other great uh, occupants there too, like Pitt. And Lord Haig? Well, I think um, it's not so much one occasion as that Churchill is a permanent presence, really, in our lives and our, our political conduct. You know, I, I visited... Um, uh, 83 countries, I think it was, as Foreign Secretary in four years, uh, and most of them produced, uh, brought to mind Churchill's um, saying that democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others, uh, because you could really see the others uh, in action and um, all the terrible problems that result from that and the human rights abuses and everything else. So I think what Churchill said is always with us. And the other thing that's always with us is the, um, as people who've been political leaders, is the idea that you can triumph over adversity. Uh, as John quite rightly said a few moments ago, neither he nor I experienced adversity of the intensity of, of Churchill. Um, but we do always draw inspiration from that, that 1940 spirit um, that it is possible to succeed against seemingly impossible odds. Of course, we've also had occasions in our career where we didn't succeed against impossible odds. Uh, so Churchill was an inspiration, but um, we didn't necessarily do as well as Churchill. There's a great quote by, I think it was Ed Murrow, uh, that Churchill mobilized the English language and sent it to war. And he did so in a gift that few of us have ever had. Certainly, I didn't. And that is a remarkable gift. And if you look at his speeches, he was often cruelly honest about the difficulties that our country faced in the war, but ended most of his speeches on an upbeat note of hope. 
And I think that was extraordinarily inspirational. And of course, we have those speeches, the drafts and notes here at Churchill College in the Archive Centre. But I wonder if for the next question, I can just pick up on, on something that, that Lord Haig said. And this comes from, from Mark. Um, and he says, do you have concerns for the survival of democracy, given the current geographical stresses, the growth of populism and the resurgence of strongman leaders? Who would like to take that first? Lord Haig? Um, yes, I'll, I'll take my turn. Uh, absolutely. Well, I do have some concerns. I think um, democracy is a, a extremely resilient and robust, and there is a sufficiently widespread understanding of what it needs among many populations of the world that it isn't easily destroyed, you know, and you can see in many countries in recent years um, that people will take action and vote out governments uh, when they can see corruption or abuse of power. Um, look at what's happened in Malaysia or South Africa and many other countries of the world. Um, so that should give us some confidence in democracy. But there are some very serious threats. And um, the greatest one is, is deep polarization, is, is the loss of a common set of values. We can see that very much in the United States uh, at the moment, uh, such deep polarization that it seems 98% of people made up their minds and won't change them about the, how they vote in the, the US election uh, because they're culturally identifying with one candidate or another. And the ability of foreign countries to interfere in a democratic procedures through social media is very serious um, and has now become very common in, in Russian interference in the United States and across most European countries. So we are going to have to develop a greater consciousness of that problem and take actions, it goes back to what John was saying earlier about seeing the other person's point of view to, to prevent deeper polarization in democratic societies. We're going to have to do a bit more of that if democracies are going to, be, are going to continue to be successful. Sir John? In the last... 10 years, democracy has been in modest retreat. Um, there are fewer fully democratic countries today than there were then. And that is the wrong trend after what had happened in the past. And there is an attraction to autocracy, to people who are very poor and have very little. Autocratic regimes can take action more speedily. And in some cases, that is quite attractive to people who have nothing and hope for something. And we need, to, we need to counter that attraction of autocracy. Fortunately, autocrats give us the opportunity to do so. Um, there's a quote that came from a very senior Chinese source very recently, and I'll, I'll, I'll read it to you. We believe no comments challenging national sovereignty and social stability fall within the scope of freedom of expression. That is thought control at its most repressive. So we cannot afford to be gullible about autocrats. They are potentially very dangerous indeed. And as we have seen many times in history, once they gain power, they are extraordinarily difficult to dislodge. So democracy has to fight for its future. If we sit there and take it for granted, we will do it no service at all. Okay, and I think that leads very nicely into a question from Hugo, which builds on remarks that you've both made. Uh, his question is, now that Britain has left the EU, what new opportunities can an independent UK foreign policy create in terms of reforming the UN Security Council or re-engaging in terms of relations with Russia? So how much independence of action, what sort of independent foreign policy can we have? Well, well, I don't know where to start with that. Um, as a member of the European Union, we actually were quite dominant in what determined foreign policy, certainly during the years that Margaret Thatcher was there and the years I was there. I can't speak afterwards. William certainly uh, will be able to. But I can't see very much 
that we could propose that we could not have proposed through the European Union and then had more clout in trying to persuade others to, uh, to join us. So I'm afraid we do have a theoretical greater sovereignty in choosing our foreign policy once we are divorced from Europe. But I think we have a lesser clout in encouraging other countries to take our line, join us, and enable that policy to become a, uh, a reality. And I will, if I may, offer you a practical illustration. At the end of the first Gulf War, uh, President Bush, myself and others, made the decision rightly, in my view, as events subsequently showed, not least the second Gulf War, not to go in to Iraq and uh, drag Saddam Hussein out by the heels. We decided not to do that. So he did manage to stay, and he then started a murderous regime against the Kurds in the north of Iraq. And nobody was very keen on reigniting dispute to deal with that. And I went to Europe with an idea of safe havens for the Kurds. The European Union supported the British idea. The British then approached members of the Commonwealth and persuaded them to back it as well. And although the United States was initially reluctant, faced with the support of the United Kingdom, the European Union and much of the Commonwealth, they joined in and led it. And a huge number of people who were being murdered by Saddam Hussein had their lives saved. Now that was a piece of British diplomacy that was magnified because of our membership of the European Union and because of our contact beyond it. Now, it may be that uh, uh, wiser people than me uh, in the United Kingdom today can see ways of doing that unilaterally, but I am sceptical that we will have greater foreign policy clout alone than we did as member, members of a 500 million bloc. Because although it's an uncomfortable thing for the British to say... There are many emerging countries, India, that William mentioned earlier as a supreme example, who over the next 50 years are clearly going to become more powerful in the world with over a billion citizens than the UK will have with less than 0.9% of the world's population. So I'm sceptical that we can do more on our own. We may have a greater freedom to do what we wish to try and do, but in achieving it, I'm not sure we will have more clout than we had as members of the European Union. And Lord Haig, are you any more optimistic? Well, only a little more. I come from the same uh, basic point of view on this as Sir John, so uh, let me not take a long time in, in answering. I mean, uh, as British Foreign Secretary, I didn't feel very constrained by being in the EU. Uh, foreign policy was decided by unanimity. If the UK, France and Germany... Uh, got their ducks in a row, then that became the European policy. Um, there is, just to, to try to give a positive answer and, and think um, creatively for the future about it, um, there will be opportunities for Britain to take a lead on issues where the EU is a bit slow. And um, one of those uh, uh, has just arisen in the case of Belarus, um, the UK and Canada a few weeks ago took the lead together in putting sanctions on President Lukashenko of, of Belarus. The European Union then actually did follow a couple of weeks later, so I'm not holding this up as an enormous uh, example. But the UK outside the EU can sometimes blaze the trail on something that needs doing by, by Europe as a whole. So let us hope there will be... Um, there will be opportunities for, for that sort of leadership. The foreign policy um, sort of conception that, that Churchill worked to, the strategic framework, was always to try and maintain a balancing act between um, Europe, between the Commonwealth and between um, the wider English-speaking world, by which he increasingly came to, to, to mean the United States. Um, Going forward, what sort of balancing act do you think the UK is, is going to have to maintain um, to, to maintain its position? 
Oh, I think that's fairly straightforward. Um, uh, plainly, if we want to maximise our, uh, our own influence, uh, we need to persuade the United States and Europe above all. The Commonwealth also would be a, a very welcome addition from time to time. But, but the two areas that will add the greatest bulk of power to anything we wish to propose would be uh, the United States and the European Union. And we will need to continue as far as we can outside the European Union to be a bridge uh, between Western European views generally, including ourselves and them, and our joint interests with the rest of the world. I think we're still going to have to work with them, and uh, I hope we do. Lord Haig? I would add uh, one other thing. I, I, I do uh, agree with that in terms of the, the blocks of power in the, in the Western world. Um, I think there's another thing to add now, um, which is to look at the world as a, as a network on top of those. Uh, it's not just a world of blocks. It's a, it's a world of networks in which we have to have as many connections as possible. Um, with individual nations on a bilateral basis. This is the sort of thing we can do outside the EU, although it wasn't preventing us from doing it being inside the EU. Um, and so with Latin America, across Southeast Asia, but particularly across the whole Asia Pacific, given that from this year onwards, more than half the global GDP will be derived from Asia Pacific, we have to have, be, be creating new connections with every one of those countries, however large or small. And so I would think of it now less in terms of the, those three circles of Churchill and balance and more in terms of the vast network that we all need now in order to be successful in the 21st century. Mm. Okay, and Sir John, we should give you the last word here. Well, I, I agree with that. Um, uh, I didn't mention the networks, and I should have done, and William is, is right to bring them in. One illustration makes the point. Long before we entered the European Union, we were the largest traders with Latin America. We are now relatively small presence in uh, Latin America compared proportionately to what we had in, in 1900. And, of course, alone, we will have to, for our own interest look to build up those old alliances, and Latin America may well be one of them. And the network concept is exactly the way I think we would, uh, we would attempt to do it. And there, are, th there will be areas like that outside the European Union which will provide opportunities that I hope the United Kingdom will be able to take. And of course, one thing you can say about Winston Churchill was that he was uh, a phenomenal networker um, on, on many fronts. So um, I'm a very sorry that we're going to have to end it there. There are certainly more questions. This clearly could have gone on and on. It, it only remains for me to, to thank you both, Sir John and, and Lord Haig, for taking the time um, to, to join us um, this afternoon. I think you've given us a fantastic, inspiring start um, to our conference, exactly the sort of start we wanted. Um, a masterclass in leadership in adversity, drawing on your own experience, but also emphasising the importance of being able to, to draw on, on history. So thank you both very, very much. Thank you. We're thank you. about to go to our first break in this virtual conference. But before we do, um, I promised... Um, that we would have some quiz questions. I'm now going to give you your very first question, which should be appearing on the quiz screen below your main, main screen if you want to scroll down now. Um, alternatively, you can just stay in the main screen with me. But our question is, Churchill, as you've heard, was there at the, at the time of the birth of the Soviet Union and, and vehemently opposed it describing the arrival of uh, Lenin um, in Moscow as like the importation of a plague bacillus. But when was the Soviet Union officially dissolved? I think you've had a clue in this um, um, presentation. Was it A, November 1989, B, December 1991, C, August 1999, or D, May 2000? Please click the answer now. And as I said, we're now going to go to about a 15-minute break, um, and then we will have our next session on painting as more than a pastime. But 
For those of you um, who don't want to go away, who don't need to go and get a cup of tea or whatever, we want this conference to inspire you. We want you to, to start thinking about leadership, about oratory, about overcoming adversity. And in that spirit, we're now going to show some inspirational videos during the break. Our first one features some of the Society's members and friends and some famous faces reading some of Churchill's famous lines. Um, we will then show you some of the winning videos from our recent Inspire Like Churchill competition, which had over 600 entries from all over the world. That competition challenged you to come up with your own words and messages in response to the pandemic. And as you'll see from the winning videos, you more than rose to the challenge. OK, we'll resume shortly. I would say to the House, as I have said to those who have joined this government, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears and sweat. We have before us an ordeal of the most grievous kind. We have before us many, many long months of struggle and of suffering. You ask, what is our policy? I say it is to wage war by sea, land and air with all our might and with all the strength that God can give us to wage war against the monstrous tyranny never surpassed in the dark and lamentable catalogue of human crime. You ask, what is our aim? I can answer in one word. It is victory. Victory at all costs. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory, however long and hard the road may be. For without victory, there is no survival. But I take up my task with buoyancy and hope. I feel sure that our cause will not be suffered to fail among men. At this time, I feel entitled to claim the aid of all, and I say, come then, let us go forward together with our united strength. The whole of the warring nations are engaged. Not only soldiers, but the entire population men, women, and children. The fronts are everywhere. The trenches are dug in the towns and streets. Every village is fortified. Every road is barred. The front line runs through the factories. The workmen are soldiers with different weapons, but the same courage. One of the ways to bring this war to a speedy end is to convince the enemy not by words, but by deeds, that we have both the will and the means, not only to go on indefinitely, but to strike heavy and unexpected blows. The road to victory may not be as long as we expect, but we have no right to count upon this. Be it long or short, rough or smooth, we mean to reach our journey's end. We cannot tell what lies ahead. It may be that greater ordeals lie before us. We shall face whatever is coming to us. We are sure of ourselves and sure of our cause, and that is the supreme fact that has emerged in this time of trial. Meanwhile, we have not only fortified our hearts, but our island. The gratitude of every home in our island, in our empire, and indeed throughout the world, except in the abodes of the guilty, goes out to the British Airmen, Undaunted by odds and wearied in a constant challenge and mortal danger, are turning the tide of the world war by their prowess and by their devotion. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many, so few. The right to guide the course of world history is the noblest prize of victory. We're still toiling up the hill. We have not yet reached the crest line of it. We cannot survey the landscape or even imagine what its condition will be when that longed for morning comes. The task which lies before us immediately is at once more practical, more simple and more stern. I hope, indeed I pray, that we shall not be found unworthy of our victory if after toil and tribulation it is granted to us. 
For the rest, we have to gain the victory. That is our task. Death and sorrow will be the companions of our journey. Hardship, our garment. Constancy and valor, our only shield. We must be united. We must be undaunted. We must be inflexible. The discoveries of healing science must be the inheritance of all. That is clear. Disease must be attacked, whether it occurs amongst the poorest or the richest, man or woman, simply on the grounds that it is the enemy. And it must be attacked, just in the same way as the fire brigade will give its full assistance to the humblest cottage as readily as to the most important mansion. I was very glad that Mr. Attlee described my speeches in the war as expressing the will, not only of Parliament, but of the whole nation. Their will was resolute and remorseless, and as it proved, unconquerable. It fell to me to express it. And if I have found the right words, you must remember that I have always earned my living by my pen and by my tongue. It was a nation and race dwelling all around the globe that held the lion heart. I had the luck to be called upon to give the war. Never give in, never give in, never, 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 in nothing great or small, dark or petty, never give in, except to convictions of honour and good sense. Let us go forward together. This is no time for ease and comfort. It is time to dare and endure. Winston Churchill's words had spirit. In these words, he shared strength and grit to strive forth and be counted. I'm our income. I'm 12 years old and in the last few months have demonstrated that as a nation and a human race, that we have the strength and grit to beat this virus. It may change us, but we will adapt. It may hurt us, but we will recover. It may take from us those we love, and we will mourn, but we will emerge like a phoenix and build a brighter, better, more resilient world. This is the time to dare and endure. Thank you. Hi, my name's Hatton Only. I've been fighting for my life since I was born, but I had to embrace each equal smile. I've spent a lot of time in isolation in hospital and at home. Things that have helped me to stay happy at home and like being ill are the fun things that my family playing games and speaking to my friends. It's also important to talk about the things you are worrying about and to ask for help. When I'm scared, I pray to the angels and that helps to make me feel safe. I nearly died so many times, but I'm still here today to make a speech. My grandfather was kamikaze pilot in the land of the rising sun. On the tarmac poised to take off, self-destruct. The colonel screamed, kill your engine. The war is done. As a child, I despised Churchill, fearing grandpa's shame. Moving to East London, another perspective I did gain. It's important to remember in COVID days as these, before the war, England was broke with apathy, a view to lie down and appease. But Churchill sought to fight Hitler's fast and gone viral. Victory, he claimed. For without victory, there is no survival. My grandfather never fully knew Churchill's democratic worth, but Sir Winston's gift manifest when Grandpa held him in his arms, celebrating his grandchild's birth. Frontline workers, nurses and doctors like a modern RAF will pull us through. Let's stop and take a moment to think what Sir Winston said. So much owed by so many to so few.
My grandfather was kamikaze pilot in the land of the rising sun on the tarmac poised.
welcome back. And weren't those videos amazing and inspirational? I hope you all enjoyed our first session. I'm only sorry that we couldn't get through all of the questions, but don't be deterred. Keep them coming and perhaps you'll get chosen next time. Um, I owe you an answer to the quiz question that I asked just before the break. I asked you for the date of the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And the correct answer was December 1991. 1989 was the fall of the Berlin Wall. 1999 was when Putin became Prime Minister and 2000 when he became President. I think the clue was there, actually, if you listen to, to some of Sir John's remarks, because, of course, the dissolution happened during his premiership. But now it's time to, to move on to our next section. How did Churchill cope with adversity? One important coping mechanism for him was undoubtedly painting. He took up his paintbrush in response to his greatest uh, political setback, um, uh, his fall from office over the Dardanelles operation. Thereafter, painting as a pastime provided a great comfort to him and allowed him to channel his restless energy. Some of his earliest canvases were literally forged in war, produced in the trenches in 1916 when he was commanding a battalion of the Royal Scots Fusiliers. Thereafter, he consistently turned to painting as a source of pleasure and also as a challenge and a stimulus. In this session, we're going to look in detail at Churchill as a painter. So where better to start than Chartwell, Churchill's home in the Weald of Kent? Randolph Churchill, his great-grandson, was there recently to film this introduction to our session. And he'll be followed by Catherine Carter, the senior collections and house manager at Chartwell. She is going to open the doors, specially for you, and take you inside their newly refurbished painting studio. So this element of the conference is going to focus on my great-grandfather's love of painting, which really pulled him out of the darkest moment at the time when he lost his office over the Dardanelles and he came to painting. And he said, we may content ourselves with a joyride in a paint box. And for this, audacity is the only ticket. And what better place to be than here at Chartwell, the place where he loved to capture so many moments, whether it's looking down through his vegetable garden across the views of the Weald of Kent, whether it's capturing still life of his roses or the golden orf swimming in his fish pond. This is the place which really captured his heart, love and imagination. Today, Catherine Carter is going to show you how the studio has been rehung with some really exciting new finds and additions. So many unique moments are captured in immortality and Chartwell have so lovingly cared for all these paintings over the years. We're also going to look at Winston's love of painting in the south of France. And uh, Paul Rafferty, an outstanding young artist, has followed in Churchill's footsteps. And he's captured the spots where Churchill painted and made many exciting new discoveries. And Paul's book's coming out this autumn. It is an absolute panorama of why Winston was inspired to spend so much time in the south of France. Welcome to Churchill's painting studio here at Chartwell, where he was able to indulge in the hobby that he called a joyride in a paint box. Churchill painted well over 500 canvases during his lifetime, and we have about a third of his total output as an artist here at Chartwell, with over 140 here in the studio alone. As part of our major project over the last three years, we have been able to undertake a redisplay of this space in order to bring it more into the look and feel that Churchill knew it during his lifetime. When Chartwell first opened the studio in 1968, the space looked very different to how you see it today. 
A lot of the walls had been whitewashed and there were far fewer paintings, so it felt much more sparse by comparison. We were very fortunate over the decades that followed to have a number of paintings gifted to us in the bequests of Lady Churchill, her daughter Sarah, and her youngest daughter Mary. And as a result, we saw an increasing number of paintings here to really enrich the display. However, there was never an overall rethink of the display of this space during that time. And it's only now that we've been able to completely redisplay it, which has included, amongst other things, reinstalling some of the original infrastructure and shelving, stripping back the paint layers to bring back the original oak which Churchill had here and which created a frame effect for his canvases, and also change the order in which the paintings are displayed. First of all, to bring more key pieces down to easier sight lines for our visitors, but also to recreate Churchill's own hang and his wonderful display of the space, which really is a kaleidoscope of colour. In terms of the riot of colour that you see in this room, it's reflected in Churchill saying once that he rejoiced in the brilliant colours and felt genuinely sorry for the poor browns which is why when you look around the studio today, it really does show the joy and the exuberance with which he was able to approach painting. Among the paintings redisplayed and brought down to easier sight lines for our visitors is one of Churchill's most important paintings. It is his first ever painting, and it's this one here, Ho Farm, painted in 1915. The context of it is that Churchill is painting whilst staying in Ho Farm with his family and he sees his sister-in-law Goonie Churchill painting with watercolours and is inspired and decides to try and take up the hobby himself. Beyond the stay at Ho Farm, the wider context of that summer is that Churchill is out of political favour. He has by that point been largely scapegoated for the Dardanelles military disaster and Clementine, his wife, said at one point that she thought he would die of grief. Winston, however, reflects on that summer with a more positive tone by saying that the muse of painting came to his rescue, and the result of which is this very accomplished first endeavour into his new hobby. Coming forward a few years, we have Churchill's only ever self-portrait, it's a remarkable composition, very striking, and one of the reasons for its style is that he's being heavily influenced by his friend, the artist Sir John Lavery, at that time. And one of Sir John Lavery's hallmarks is having a very brightly lit figure in the centre of the canvas and a dark background around it. So you can see that Churchill has applied this method to his self-portrait. You can also see that it's a very young depiction of him. He still has the red hair after all. But there's also the fact that this is said to be a metaphor. He is still rebuilding his political career following the Dardanelles. He is still on the ascendancy and working his way back up the ranks to try and get to the level he was before the First World War. And so there he is, shrouded in darkness, and yet there is light through his painting. Moving on from the self-portrait, we come to the years in which Churchill is exploring different techniques and ways of developing as an artist. The ruins of Arras Cathedral, for example, is a copy of a John Singer Sargent painting and a method by which, through seeing how other artists depicted scenes, he could then improve himself. We also have the magic lantern technique, which is where you put a photograph negative into a magic lantern and it blasts the image onto the canvas so you can recreate it. And really, this is an exercise in developing your ability to depict three dimension. So it's a way of improving rather than for the end product itself. But it's always interesting to see which photographs Churchill has chosen to recreate. And in this case, it's a lovely scene of a parrot with a number of children looking up in wonder. We also have the grid technique, which alongside the magic lantern was introduced to Churchill by Walter Sickett. The grid technique is particularly good if you want to do portraits but don't necessarily have a sitter. And what's wonderful about that one is that Churchill has left the grid in order to show the fact that it is part of this exercise. 
and he's picked a photograph at himself at a horse racing meeting. This is in the late 20s by this point, so perhaps Churchill, by that point busy as Chancellor of the Exchequer, enjoyed recreating an image of him at rest. And lastly, we have the application of the grid technique in the painting Mary's first speech. And this is a wonderful family moment where Mary is laying the foundation stone of what would later become the Mary Cot, the playhouse that exists to this day in the kitchen garden at Chartwell. And it's such a wonderful family moment. You've got Randolph, Mary and Winston, and it says a great deal that he felt it was such an important moment he had to capture it on canvas. Across this row, we explore some of Churchill's later paintings and styles, from Impressionism to holiday painting. But there's one in particular I would like to introduce you to, and it's my favourite here in the studio. It's called View of Chartwell. It was painted in 1938, and it sees Winston Churchill taking his canvas, easel and oil paints to the northernmost corner of the estate. So he's looking out across his gardens and beyond that, the Weald of Kent. It's an autumnal day, so you can imagine it's very chilly, but the light is so beautiful that Churchill is determined to capture it. Now, it's been a difficult year for the Churchill family. At one point earlier in the year, they were considering having to sell Chartwell and it was briefly listed on the market. By the autumn, however, his finances looking somewhat healthier, he knew he would be able to keep Chartwell. So there's a sense of relief, I think, to this painting as well, that the home he loved so much would continue to remain with him and his family. But beyond that, 1938, of course, the clouds of war are forming across Europe. And beyond that Weald of Kent is the South Coast, the Channel and mainland Europe beyond. So perhaps Churchill picked this angle, looking out across the home he loved so much, knowing that if an invasion of England were to happen, this landscape might well be changed forever. The project that we have undertaken here in the studio has allowed us to revisit how Churchill engaged with his own paintings, how he showed them to friends and family, and perhaps most importantly, the fact that what we see before us is a visual diary. Churchill didn't write a diary, but he did paint one, and that's what you can see in the studio at Chartwell today. Well, our thanks to Randolph and Catherine for that wonderful introduction and for reminding us of the beauty of Chartwell. Um, we're now going to continue the discussion and I'm going to hand over to my friend and colleague, Barry Phipps. Barry is an art historian. He's director of studies in the history of art here at Churchill College, as well as at Hughes Hall in the University of Cambridge. He teaches and writes on modern and contemporary art and somehow, he manages to combine this academic workload with the role of looking after the college's art collection, which includes two of Churchill's original oil paintings. Barry is a member of the Churchill's pa Churchill Paintings Group, which is charged with maintaining the definitive catalogue of Churchill's works. So I think we're in very safe hands and I can think of no one better to chair this session. Barry, welcome to the stage. Thank you, Alan. Well, hello everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be here today and I'd like to thank Alan and all of those involved with the International Churchill Society for inviting me to speak with Paul Rafferty. Paul is an extraordinary artist. He was born in Oxford, moved to California and now resides in the south of France with his wife and family. Paul spends much of his time, almost all of his time, out in the landscape of the south of France, painting canvas after canvas after canvas. This has resulted in Paul having a number of international shows, not least in Florida, in New York and other places. He has, in fact, a new show of works coming up in London at the Portland Gallery 
on Piccadilly, near Piccadilly, uh, which runs from the 9th until the 20th of November this year. So, Paul, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and an honour to be here. Paul, you're the author of a forthcoming book, and I'd like to invite you to tell us a little bit about that before you set the scene for the film that you've made. Uh, thank you. It's a, a book that started quite organically. A friend of mine, Carl Terry, and I used to paint, well, both of us would paint many locations that Churchill would paint. And um, over the years, I'd, I'd been aware of Churchill's painting. I'd actually seen an old watercolor in Los Angeles. And I got in touch with David Coombs, who let me know that he never painted in watercolor. So my interest was sparked in Churchill's paintings. And then the idea of a book came, and finally we have reached this point where I actually have this lovely book that I'm very proud of. First book, and it's a, it's a lovely thing. So it, it's been a, a, a long, not arduous, but enjoyable trip, a labour of love, finding many locations. Wonderful. And you've made a film about the book. I did. It was actually to try to bring it alive. There's so much you can do in a book, but because of the purposes of this talk, I thought it would actually be lovely to be in the environment and to actually see, to hear the waves and to see the environment and the light that he enjoyed so much to paint. Well, it's wonderful. So may I invite you to show the film before we engage in our short conversation thereafter? Please do. In 1915, the muse of painting came to Winston Churchill. He was 40 years old and it would stay with him for the rest of his life. In 2015, I began a journey to find these locations. I took a joyride in a paint box along the French Riviera. While Mr. Churchill was on holiday at Monte Carlo, he spent a good deal of his time painting at Cap Dye. As everyone knows, he's pretty good at it too. And what's quite clear from our film is that on the Côte d'Azur, he not only had some very attractive subjects to paint, but also plenty of tools with which to finish the job. So we're here at the Column d'Or in St. Paul de Vence, and Churchill had lunch here and signed the guest book. But what we're interested in is a painting that he did of the fountain in the old village. This painting featured in the BBC programme Fake or Fortune is of the fountain in St. Paul de Vence. During my research, I was allowed to go to Chartwell and look through the archive and actually found a photograph of it, a mysterious figure holding the painting. Ultimately, we proved that it was Churchill holding the painting at Chateau Horizon in the mid-1930s, so it was authenticated and added to the canon. A rare thing to happen and a real highlight for the book. Chateau Belsum was one of the few places on the Riviera that Lady Churchill liked to stay. A recent discovery is of the pavilion. This was thought to have been painted at Port Lim in Kent. 
though this is still yet to be confirmed by the Churchill Paintings Group. In the 1920s, Churchill met Gabrielle Coco Chanel, instantly taken by this capable and agreeable woman. Winston's publisher, Emery Reeves, later purchased La Pausa. Churchill relished his time there in the 1950s, painting and writing much of the English-speaking peoples. town of Mougins, the chapel of Notre Dame de Ville. It lies just above Cannes, and in 1934, Winston Churchill pitched his easel up just over there. Staying at the Chateau Horizon on the coast, Churchill would visit the Guinness family at the Mad de Notre Dame de Ville, which lies just next door. Years later, this would become the final home and studio of Picasso. When Churchill traveled, he would have a veritable studio on location with this enormous easel, parasols, T-squares, brushes, paint, Stetson hat, cigars, and of course his Johnny Walker and soda. And it would be the job of his valet and the Scotland Yard detectives to set this equipment up for him. This particular canvas is a 20 by 24 inch and it was quite a common size for him. And they were usually supplied by Roberson and Co in London. And of course, his beloved palette. He loved his colors and they would all be fully out there. He actually wrote a letter about this painting to his wife Clementine in 1934 from Chateau Horizon. He says, My darling, I have painted four pictures and begun another. I think you will be surprised by them. I have done a new one of Notre Dame de Ville, a la Nicholson, very luminous. If you like it, it shall be for your bedroom at the flat instead of another. It is the best I think I have yet done. Signed, W. And I think he's right. I think he's captured the dappled light on the church perfectly. Between Cannes and San Rafael on the coast lie the red rocks of the Estrell Mountains. In the 1930s, Churchill would discover these remote locations and commit them to canvas. This is one of the last locations that I found and one I thought I'd never make. Red rocks on a coastline full of red rocks. But I luckily found this antique postcard and I recognized the shape of the cliff behind me. It also had a name, Latreus. So I zoomed in on Google Earth and I found where I thought he stood and then I came to visit and sure enough, this is the spot, this remote bay. Now Churchill had a word for places that he thought were very paintable. It was a made up word of paintacious. And as an artist, if I were setting up, this is paintacious to me but he made the unusual compositional choice of zooming on this cliff face. And there's about an hour of light where it turns vivid red against the blue. And this is what he ended up with. And I think that was his motivation for painting, is purely color.
So we're here at the Porte de Crouton, which is on the west side of Cap d'Antibes toward the end of the day. And this painting was a great discovery for me because it led to another well-known painting, which I'll show you in a moment. But this arch in the wall was the key that made me find this. I remembered it while driving around here, possibly painting here. And this deco building is still there, as is the white large villa on top of the hill. But this lovely jetty, this stone jetty is still here. The beach has changed now into little huts. The fishing boats that he's put in with the little figures to give it life, not much has changed. It's still very much a little working port, even though there are a lot more pleasure craft here now. And that led me to finding this painting, which is called A Study of Boats. It took me months to find this. But once I found the other one, I realized he's just turned his easel around and he's painted on the same harbor wall. You can see the peninsula of Cap d'Antibes in the distance. And it becomes all apparent once you know where it is. This was a very successful painting for Churchill in that it was made into prints and it was often reproduced in books and magazines. And it's a very successful find for us. I am the very model of a modern major general. I have information, vegetable, animal, and mineral. I know the kings of England and decode the fights historical from Marathon to Waterloo in order categorical. I am very well acquainted to his matters mathematical. I understand the question. In 1948, the Time magazine followed Churchill on a painting trip through Provence. The photographer captures this journey in candid images. We pass through Lourdes Marin, Fontaine de Vaucluse, Trois Sauté Bridge near Aix en Provence and the Mount St. Victoire, so often painted by Cézanne, who was such an influence on Churchill. And differential calculus. I know the scientific names of beings and in Malculus. In short, in matters vegetable, animal and mineral, I am the very model of a modern major general. Winston Churchill is painting fearless impressions in our garden these days. It reminds me of Nero fiddling. This was in a letter from Ralph Curtis in 1921 from the Villa Sylvia in saint jean cap -Ferrat. I discovered two Churchill paintings here, and what makes this remarkable is that no one ever knew Churchill was there with John Lavery painting.
Paul, that's a remarkable film. Thank you. And Much harder than the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, if that's the film, the, the book is going to be a blockbuster, believe me. Now, what I'd like to do, if, if you don't mind, is to shape this conversation, uh, firstly around your work, because I think it's important for the audience to understand your trajectory towards Churchill's painting and their kind of unique insight as an artist uh, bringing to another artist's work. So yeah. could we just talk a little bit about your own biographi uh, biographical sketch as an artist? Tell us a little bit about where it began, how you started, what techniques you use. Well, I've, I've always painted in oil and um, I, I've painted for decades professionally. That's what I do for a living. This is a labor of love. But I think it, it's not really, I can't say it's unique, but it's a rare um, simpatico I have, an understanding I have with the way he painted because I do paint on location. Not quite at the size he painted, but I do paint on location and I understand um, all the, the trials and tribulations that you go through. To tie it in even with the title, the, um, the adversity that we go through. Mm -hmm. I think Churchill fundamentally found uh, escape from adversity in painting. He genuinely enjoyed it and it was an escapism as it is for many artists. But there is a battle that we go with within a painting and he actually described it as a battle that, during that course. And I think it's the thing that keeps you coming back. So for my own painting, I've actually painted many of the locations without knowing, as I said before, I've been to Marrakesh and painted before I knew Churchill went there um, in America, obviously in Britain. So there is this wonderful thread that I have. I, again, I can't say it's unique, but it's quite rare that I, I come to this with that. And, and what, what are you hoping to capture as an artist? If, if indeed that's the correct phase, phrase, uh, why do you paint? What do you want to paint? What do you want the viewer to see in your painting? Well, for me personally, I think I'm a representational impressionist type painter like Churchill. Um, so I go to the subject and I'm inspired by the light. I think that's what he was, a very, as he called it, paintacious place or, or subject. It's still life figure, whatever it was that catches your eye. But it tends to be about light and how, how you translate that. He didn't start painting until he's 40 years old. And I really do believe that he started seeing the world differently, physically, clouds, things that he would wonder as every artist does, how would I get that on canvas? And it's, uh, again, something that uh, possibly in his writing, he was aware of, of things, but visually you become much more attuned to that. And I would say it, Churchill was very much an impressionist painter. Mm. And, and what are the obstacles? I mean, you talk about the adversity of painting outside, for instance. Why on earth would you want to make your life more difficult by leaving the comfort of the studio and setting up near the rocky shores of the Atlantic, for instance. You see things on location that you don't see in the studio. I think both has its place, and he definitely painted in the studio. He would even use a magic lantern to project things on, a, uh, on a canvas and grid up from photographs that Sickert taught him. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing wrong with that. And there's almost as much for certain people, certain artists, enjoyment of that. And some exclusively work that way. But there's nothing like going outside in, in the, on the spot. Munnings, Alfred, Sir Alfred Munnings was a very big proponent of that. And in 1947, he went round to choose some of the work at Chartwell. And he noted that the large canvases around the studio, they all, they all had a tack, a tack written all over them. And he loved the fact that Churchill would go out into the landscape and, and paint. So there is a challenge there and it can be strange to some people, but it's so rewarding when you've actually been there and captured it. There's nothing like it. And so for those people who aren't artists, can you tell us how one sets about setting up the canvas? Do, do you gesso the canvas? Do you put ground on there? You're forever up against it in terms of the fleeting light, for instance. The well, not in Churchill's case. Churchill had detectives and valets and people that did all of that for him. <laughs> I mean, he was not spoiled, but he was definitely pampered in that uh -huh. way. But um, conversely, he worked large and he jumped in and he did it all himself. And um, 
me personally, yes, I will stretch my own canvas, prepare my own boards. But I think even that physical element he enjoyed. I think he loved every aspect of painting. For instance, Willie Sachs, his color man for the last 18 years, he was very involved with the paints he had. And he had two tubes of paint made that I, uh, uh, it was called Churchill Blue for skies. And it wasn't his laziness. He was frustrated with um, not being able to have a blue out of the tube for the sky. So I think his involvement in his materials, he would use the best he could have, Robeson canvases, as I said in the film. So, but he didn't actually do all of those things that were prepared and set up for him. And, but that aside, I think, you're still, as an artist, setting yourself up for something very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, because if, if your role, or if you've chosen to paint the particular effects of light on a scene, that's so, that light is forever moving. So how does one set about interpreting that light onto the canvas? How would Churchill have used brush techniques, for instance, um, dry, drying oils, linseed oils within oil paint? I mean, no, can you tell us something it, about the process? Yes, he had, I think he did have, there's a, a, um, the Sachs family, again, very um, kindly gave me the secret formula he had, and there was an element of drying oils in the linseed oil, I think, that he used. But I, he would he would take them back to the studio and he would work on them from photographs. Um, at the very end, he gave his detectives a nice camera. But before that, he would summon a photographer. There's a story of him in Belgium where the uh, the detective or valet described this story where he summoned a photographer to capture the scene. So that's why there are some photographs at the studio archive in Chartwell of these photographs that he would later work on because it was hard for him to finish. But apparently, according to Sergeant Murray, he was a very fast worker. In an hour, an hour and a half, he could really cover a canvas, which helped him. But you're always disappointed in nature. It's always going to be more beautiful than you have. I don't care if you're Monet or whomever. But when you get back to the studio and you've captured something of what you saw that day, suddenly that becomes a new reality. And that's what excited him. And on a rainy day at Chartwell, he would pull a Marrakesh or a South of France painting out and start working on it again. Bring some sunshine back into the studio, I might say. Very much so. And I think he was, the, I'm always asked what do I feel about Churchill. I think he was very bold. He would jump in. There was no messing about. He would he would go for it. Like Money says, it was attack, attack all over the canvas. Mm. And it's too easy to use all these phrases. I think he was an emotional man, a sensitive man. Um, it's, it's very easy to use these bulldog terms and things. I think there was an element of that with his painting, but there's also a sensitivity to nature, to, to the paint. Um, as Andrew Roberts says about him crying or being aware of, of animals or whatever it was. I think he was with nature and I think it actually tunes that up with, yeah. with, with this. I, I was actually surprised to learn Churchill painted because of this multifaceted man that I, I saw is a little more less dimensions to him in that way. Yeah, actually, I'd like to talk about that a little bit more. But before we do so, could you tell us something about how he found the south of France as an artist? I mean, he's is the chronology of, of him visiting there. And then also, Paul, if you don't mind, think a little bit about why he chose the locations that he did. I don't know whether the locations were random. There are photographs of him in 2015, uh, 1915 in Monaco at the casinos. He didn't start painting until 2000, 1915, but he actually came here first night, I believe, on a proper painting trip in 1921 with Lavery. They were staying in Nice or Cannes, where Lavery's were, and, um, and then the Eden Hotel. And that's when he really started painting. And that's when the painting is a pastime and the, uh, the Strand Magazine article came out. So I think that that was the real impetus to his painting down here and his fascination and love for down here, at least from a painting point of view. And as regards to the locations, I think it was where his proximity, where he would stay at this beautiful villa, uh, villas and chateau, and, th and then he would go out from them. That, that was his, but he loved it here. Whereas Clementine didn't. She felt that it was a very much, uh, 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 um, Decadent sort not of. such a, a wonderful place in that regard with the people he did, he yeah. loved it. And so let's go, let's think about this idea that has really kind of overwhelmed Churchill's practice as an artist, which is that he used it somehow simply as a therapy to distract himself from the worries of the world. How do you feel about that? 
I think it goes further than that. There may be, I mean, this is all subjective. I've read, I've talked to people like Lady Williams that actually watched him paint, which is, people are getting fewer and fewer that actually. So, so any of my opinions are subjective like everybody else. But I feel that he definitely used this as a, a way, not of escapism, but to channel and enjoy it. But I do think he took it very seriously. I think he was very modest. It was the one thing he was terribly modest about. And, um, and I think he loved talking about art to other artists, to any artist almost. And he felt it's somewhat humble in that regard, always a, always a student and learning. And so in that regard, I think he, it was multifaceted as well. I don't think it was just a one dimensional thing that he was escaped with. I mm. think he definitely took his art very seriously. He was very proud of it. And that's absolutely clear. But what I'm trying to drive at, I think, is, is painting simply a way of distracting oneself from the worries of the world? And if that's the case, how does it distract? I mean, is it simply, Paul, about throwing some colours around the canvas, getting stuck in and then feeling better about it so you can go and do something more serious? I mean, is that really what an artist does? Well, a little bit. Sometimes it can be, it can be escapism. It, it absorbs your time. I think there's a, a line he wrote about playing golf, that he worried about the, the events of the day before or, or the, day, the days coming. He wouldn't be completely absorbed in something else. Whereas painting, even uh, a, a, an appointment of lunch would be annoying. He didn't, they used to have to get dragged away or tricked into finishing the painting because it does, uh, two, three hours can go by without you noticing. Yeah. So, yes, uh, I, it is absorbing and it flies by. And it's a mental exercise of concentration, isn't it? It does focus the attention. I mean, one might say even meditative, though that has a kind of baggage. But it does certainly well, focus. Go, you go through these... Uh, the initial uh, element is is almost like a child where you're, it's very free. Then you go through the struggling, like the battle he described. You go through struggling middle ground. And if there's any semblance of a good painting toward the end, you get this euphoria of actually, I feel I've got something. And then you, you don't want it to end because you keep putting on the final touches. So I think there's this whole gamut of feelings that you go through, depending on how you do it. And they're not all good. And I'm sure he went through many struggles where you know, he wasn't happy, but yeah. it, it, it kept him coming back. And it was definitely held his attention all his life. And it's, so one of the ideas that I've been interested in about Churchill's work is rather than thinking about the work of art on the periphery of more important things like painting and all those other kind of diplomatic questions, let's say, Churchill is someone who had painting at the centre of his, his life, really. It's, as you say, something that he came back to, he came back to. He was distracted by other world events, but yeah. certainly he returned to it. Are we able to think about how painting played a role in, in his political thinking? If, as you say, um, painting is a battle, well, is there a way of kind of using that as a space to think about his other political life within the space of that distinct concentration, for instance? Possibly. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm loath to simplify his work that he would just go out and paint something very pretty in front of him though there is an element of that if it was a beautiful scene there wasn't much more to it I think it's quite easy to try always read into well what he meant by that painting whereas a certain artist maybe Picasso Cezanne maybe they were um, putting things I don't think always so much for that with Churchill I do think there was a physical element even the one painting he did in the war that he gave to Roosevelt that the, such a lovely story I think there was an element of not only friendship, but pushing along and this personal gift that he had done and this moment that they'd shared together. Absolutely, I do, I do think it was an element of diplomacy. And he did give gift certain paintings to certain people yeah. that he cared about or appreciated. So I think, yes, it did play a role, but it's, it's, I, I, it's not for me to overstate that or, or, or really, I don't know. All I can do is understand going out into the landscape and I've, I've managed to find more than 40 locations. There's so many elements to this whole story that are quite exciting. To, to After decades, nobody knew where he stood in these paintings to actually finally stand there. So there's a, there's a whole gamut of conversation that uh, is, is, is wonderful to explore. And so given that you've written a book around the locations, yeah. could you tell us something about the adventures that you had finding the places in which 
Churchill sat and painted? Well, there's so many. There's, there, there's, uh, some of them stem from me inadvertently painting them myself, and I just keep looking. There, there's not much information in the painting, and then I suddenly realize there's one in saint jean Caffar on the west side, and I painted this from the roadside, and it was from the Villa Silvia. Mm-hmm. And it's wonderful that I found that. And then I found another painting in the garden. It's a private villa and the owners kindly allowed me to go in. And sure enough, it's there. And another one, I spent three months in the, the Mount uh, the Saint Victoire. I spent three months on Google Earth trying to find this house because it's such a vast <laughs> area. And I finally found it. I get there and the owner was excited to learn that Churchill had painted his house in, in front of the mountain, but was more excited to tell me that his grandfather was Andre Masson, a contemporary of Picasso's and a big artist that had moved to New York. So there are wonderful anecdotes as I went through this process of finding them. I actually enjoyed the process of finding them. I think that was, uh, but actually standing up as, as close as I could to the, the locations was wonderful. And I think that really comes through in the book. I mean, that's one of the joys of just going through it, reading it very carefully and looking at these stunning pictures, beautifully illustrated reproductions of Churchill's own paintings next to lavish contemporary images of the south of France. Well, yes. well it, does, it does go to a, uh, his time of this beautiful, obviously, post. Uh, uh, he was born in the Victorian time. The, this lifestyle he led, the subject he chose, the places he visited, the stately homes even in Britain, let alone in the south of France. So you do get a sense of running through his life and these opulent surroundings that are beautiful. But he, he, um, he got down in there and got his hands dirty. He's always covered in paint, and it's wonderful what he captures. So I hope that comes through in the book. It's a celebration of his, his painting. But also it gives us real insight into the works themselves, I believe. And so we think, or we tend to think, of Churchill as being somewhat traditional in his outlook. But actually the influences of the painters down in the south of France are very modern. Yes. So can you tell us something about his engagement with some of the great painters of the 20th century? Well, he was very, he loved Cezanne. He was a very, he painted a few subjects, um, possibly in homage to him. Um, I can't believe that he just found himself. Uh, no. These are uh, Trois Sauter at the bridge and uh, the Mount Saint Victoire that uh, Cezanne painted, I think, 19 times. But he also loved Matisse. Unlike that speech that Munnings purportedly gave it the, the it, Churchill didn't Churchill was trying to learn there are a few paintings that are very like the foes um post-impressionist that are, are quite bold but he's almost experimenting that's what I'm saying that he's always the student and there are traditional painters like uh, uh Nicholson and, and Paul Mars and Lavery that first taught him but he did try to explain even the even the copies that he did of Monet or Daubeny uh, and, and Sargent were very traditional painters but I think Churchill was a sponge. He was absorbing it all within a parameter. It wasn't so abstract, mm-hmm. but there was pushing of the edges and learning. And, and that's lovely to see too. Yeah. I think one of the joys for me is, that, I mean, we take Monet as, as rather a sort of um, painter that's easy on the eye these days. But actually, I mean, when those Impressionists were first starting out, they were really very radical. And actually, the way that they're putting paint onto the canvas, unprimed, not using black, using tones and shades to draw out the effects of the changing light, is really rather remarkable and actually still novel even now, I think. Yes, it is. It, it, it's, um, and I think Churchill was very inspired by that. But like I say, he, I, he's, people always comment or critique his paintings. And at the beginning, when I saw them, they were amateurish. But I've grown to have a, a real appreciation. If you try, you get a large canvas, you stand outside, even if you're a painter, do what he did, and then have a comment. It's, it, you have a different appreciation, because there's many of the paintings that I've actually stood in the front of the subject. I had these laminated cards when I would go and find the, the subject. They're actually really good. Some of them are very, very good. Yeah. And I'm, I have a different appreciation. But he, in fairness to him, he never set out to be a, a famous artist or a professional artist. It's something he loved. And people ask also, did he, did he change? I don't think he painted enough. If he painted anywhere from five or 500 to 600 canvases, it wasn't enough to radically change, even with his experimenting. Whereas if he painted all the time, I think he would have grown as a painter. I mean, his, his energy was like standing in front of a firework display 
at least in terms of paintings, because he's trying a, a whole broad range of things, both in the studio and outside of the studio. Do you think, Paul, and I'm going to put you on the spot now, do you think he ever stopped being a student and he became, became a, a great painter? No, I think toward the end there was an element of... I've got some good work here. He, I, I can imagine him standing over his canvases with his cigar, looking at the reaction. Apparently, Charlie Chaplin saw one on the wall at Chartwell and commented, you did that? And I think there's an element of pride in that. Maybe not with the Munnings and the real artists that he was surrounded with. He would probably be a little modest and meek there. But fundamentally, I think he felt like he'd, he got something proudly on canvas. Otherwise, I think for, even from an ego point of view, he wouldn't have shown it or given it away. But I still think that he knew his place in the pantheon of art. And I think that it was a hobby and he went at it. And I have great admiration for that. Yeah, me too. I mean, he did enter two paintings into the Royal Academy, of course, under a pseudonym. Yeah, so well, he didn't trust Munnings to, he said, I don't trust you a yard. He said, unless you put me in the common thing, I won't, I won't, I won't. Uh, but Munnings said that it was the quickest, uh, he was made an honorary academician. It was the quickest uh, election ever. ever. It was unanimous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, maybe it's a, it's a false question to ask whether Churchill's paintings are good or not good. I mean, I go back to my early statement where I say that actually it's, it's remarkable that some, such a figure in history has at their centre of their life almost this medium of painting which they use to concentrate and focus and work out other kinds of thinking. Yes, possibly. I think that possibly his painting um, augmented his writing, his politics. I don't know. I, yeah. I, again, it's so subjective. But I do believe that because he was very is very famous and his um, painting self uh, uh, enormous amounts of money he's judged by that it's almost like okay you're set up to be now we can critique it um whereas he really in fairness to him he he just did it because he was enjoying doing it and if anybody paid any interest or a compliment you know absolutely but i think in his head he knew where he was but that's not really the point of my book like i say it's a celebration of finding these love and also the canon of the work because I don't know whether you want to speak of it, of the St. Paul painting that is wonderful. Actually, you've preempted it. It was going to be my next, next question, this scoop. Actually, I, I was thinking about the financial value, and we shouldn't shy away from that. I mean, Churchill's paintings are very, very valuable now, and an attribution of a painting can really create a, a very expensive work of art onto the market. Okay. Now, the real scoop of your book... And I know that your book is about uh, a concentrated interest in, in a painter's work in a certain part of the world. But we can't walk, I can't let you not talk about this wonderful scoop that you made. Would you like well, to tell us a little bit? Involved. About? I mean, it, the, the, to me, it's not, it, it, it's, it's all of us. It's, uh, it's, it, you, it, because we're, we're custodians, you, you pass away, and all that's left is the right information. I was just I'm very lucky enough to be allowed to go to Chartwell. It was very kind of the ladies to let me go through all the archive photographs. And I just happened to find a photograph that was mistitled because it was another group of photographs of red rocks. But I could see in this tiny image that that was the painting of St. Paul de Vence that was on this program, BBC program. And so, um, so Paul, may I stop you there a minute? Just yes. to rehearse what happened. So on, on Fake or Fortune, there's a painting which isn't attributed because there wasn't enough evidence at the time right. you find yourself in the archive of Chartwell going yes. through the photographs which yeah, sorry. were it in didn't the have enough provenance it had a good provenance but it, it has to be um absolutely ironclad like you say with these values and and adding something it could sully the absolutely so you, you have this enormous task or David Coombs back in the day certainly on his own had this huge task of uh of, of like a, a gate and um, but finding this photograph within the bosom of the archive is, is a wonderful thing. But even then, we still had to work out who, what, who was the man holding the photograph and where was it. But it's lovely that it transpired, that it was Chateau Horizon, that we'd worked out where the wall and everything was. But this is all a team effort. This is not just I just happened to be a, a vehicle finding this thing by doing this book. But you're right. This is a wonderful culmination for me. Um, and I, maybe it will happen again because during the course of this, I've actually found photographs of, paint, of him painting and the painting's missing. Yeah. So maybe it will turn up. We don't know. Well, actually, that was going to be 
one of my fi fi uh, really? final questions. Um, but before we do that, I, I would like to acknowledge the work of David, David Coombs, who, and Minnie Churchill, who we've all benefited from, both in our work as the um, Churchill Paintings Group and for art historians thereafter. And you're yes. clearly picking that up and taking it somewhere new, which is fantastic, Paul. And well, I I'm trying to add to it, but you're right. Without all of these people, that even though I did this book, I couldn't have done it without all that many people, certainly David and Mini from the beginning, Catherine Churchill, there's so many people that have helped me without whom, you know, so I'm very happy to have added to it in some small way. Agreed. And now there's a, a real excitement that there may be some undiscovered Churchill paintings hanging in someone's front room. That's so, your job. Now the pressure. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so how, how do we know that there's lost paintings out there in the world? Well, I, I, my eye has become so attuned to finding these locations. A, paint, a picture, a photograph came up at auction in London and I actually pur purchased it. And it, it turns out that it was Sergeant Murray standing behind Churchill. It's clearly Churchill with his big easel. And I thought he, I didn't know, nobody knew where he was painting. And, but I've worked out this La Conda Cipriani and the Torcello Island off Venice. And this little hotel restaurant was very famous. Many celebrities and people have been there. So I know that there's this painting there and there's this clear photograph of the, and he's known to have painted there, but the painting is nowhere to be seen. So there are a few examples of those that we now have within your archive. And it gives us a good clue. And there may be yeah. more that will come up. But for even finding those, look, let alone finding the painting, finding what he's painting is another challenge. And um, it's, it, it's all intriguing. It's like this mystery story that keeps unraveling. And it's, I mean, it, it takes Churchill's work again into the future. This isn't the end of a chapter of someone's painted life. It's still going. And it'll I, keep I us going. I think you would laugh that there's some little painter running around the south of France finding locations. And I hope it's not here. I hope that we find more things and appreciate his paintings in a slight, not just for their financial gain, yeah. but what he did. And Paul, it's a remarkable achievement. I can't Thanks. tell you how much admiration I have for you because I know that you've put many years effort into the book. And I can highly recommend it to anyone watching this and far beyond. So I hope that you'll be able to add successful author to your <laughs> CV hereafter. But I'm going to draw our conversation to a close there and invite Alan Packwood, who I know has some questions from the audience, to give them an opportunity to speak to you. Okay. Alan. Thank you very much, Barry. Um, so it's... It's not the end, it's not even the beginning of the end, but it is the beginning of the questions from the wider general audience. Um, and it won't surprise you to know, um, we've had um, quite a few questions come in. Um, and I think the one that I'll, I'll start with is, is this. Um, so this is from Patrick, and Patrick wants to know, um, he would like me to ask both panellists, do you have a favourite Churchill painting? If so, which one and why? And perhaps we should start with, with Paul. Um, oh, that's hard, Patrick, because um, I've seen so many locations. I would probably have to say the Cassis one of the lighthouse, because I stood there and it's so striking, the image and, and the perspective that he got on it. That would probably be one of my top 10. So the lighthouse at Cassis. Yeah. Well, well, Paul, yours has to come, I think, from the south of France. But Barry, you can range... Yes, oh, I, didn't, I thought we were just speaking <laughs> in the south of France, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm going to cop out of this one, I'm afraid. I think uh, for me, it's an admiration and a critical interest in the whole body of work that I'm interested in, rather than one particular. I know that that's a cop out, but there are so many that I just mm. wouldn't be able to single down on anything at this time. Are there particular paintings from the various different phases of his, his life and career that, that you would sort of highlight as being very indicative of their type? Um, pro probably not, actually. I think I, you see each of them on their own merit rather than making... You know, I'm an art historian. Art historians don't make judgments about things. They talk about them. So it sounds like I'm absolutely <laughs> copping out, which I'm absolutely not. But I, I try and see each work in its own right, as it were, rather than judging one or making a comparison about this one where he's standing in a, in a similar landscape to this one. So, I mean, that really doesn't answer the question. I'm sorry, Patrick, but as an art historian, 
That's my position. <laughs> All right. Well, we won't try and budge you from it. Um, so let's go back to technique. And, and I think you, you did talk uh, um, quite a bit about this um, at the beginning of your conversation. Um, but we have a, a question from Bob about how long did it typically take for Churchill to complete a painting? And I suppose linked to that, did he always complete his paintings? Mm. In my opinion, uh, probably he would work on a painting a couple of hours. He wouldn't have very long. And the light, if you paint from life, if you took a photograph at the beginning, waited for the painter to finish after two hours, the, the photographs would be very different, but you don't notice it while you're painting. It's very gradual. You start to chase the shadows. And at certain times of the day, this it gets exaggerated. So I would imagine he would work for two, maximum three hours. And I think he would then finish the work off at home or if he was staying at say La Caponcina, he would go back out and finish the work another day on a similar weather, similar time of day. And he tended to work toward the afternoon. That was his preference. I found a lot of paintings as another nugget. So I hope that answers it, Bob. But th this is a problem, isn't it? It's an eternal question for painters. How do they know when a work is finished? I always you thought don't. Francis Bacon had the best answer when he said, well, when the man comes from the gallery to pick it up to take it to the exhibition. Even then, I'm going to go to my exhibition in London and I'll think that Carry I, can, I think that's the nature test. Yes. <laughs> There's a story of Bonnard doing that in a museum. <laughs> no, yeah. And so linked to that then, do either of you have evidence of Churchill going back and revisiting paintings at a later date and reworking them? Yes. Um, may I say first? No, in, one, in 1921, Catherine Churchill and I have been going back and forth on uh, one of uh, Cap Ferrat of the Voile d'Or, and it's it it's like two different paintings. That's in the photograph in the in the painting as a pastime article, and the one that's in Chartwell now, and it's been heavily painted over. It, even the Mount Saint Victoire, he changed the sky because we have a wonderful photograph of him on the location, and that's what. Clementine didn't like, she liked him to, she took the canvas away because he sometimes could kill the freshness of it by overworking a painting. Yeah, so I, I would cite that example too. But Paul, why, why do artists rework paintings? Is it because he was... Lack of satisfaction, thinking you can, it can be better. Like I just said, even on a gallery wall, I think it's the nature of always feeling like one more mark here or... It, it, it's a drive, it's a strange feeling. It's not, it's not you're always dissatisfied with your work. I just think it's the nature of growing and, and painting. And sometimes you ruin something. Um, it's very hard to keep something fresh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a character, it's a nature. Maybe it's of this type of painting, I don't know. I, I don't know of an example where he's reworked a painting successfully. I yes. think it's true to say that he did have a tendency, I mean, like anyone really, to push it a little bit too far and then it kind of goes and it's very difficult to get it back, I think. Well, his speech is the same with the rhythm of speeches, you know, uh, there's lots of crossing out or changing words over. It has a slightly different emphasis in, yeah. and rhythm. So I think there's an element of that in painting and some people really have it down and other people can just ruin something. Yeah. But I think it's innate in most people. Maybe it's in insecurity. Maybe we're constantly feeling we can make it better. But also, I mean, with, with, with impressionist painting, let's call it that. I mean, yes. it is about capturing the, the vibrancy, the fleeting moment. So, yes. I mean, once it's gone, reworking it seems irrelevant. Yeah, but they had, a, they had a, almost a dogma where they worked that way. And Absolutely. we don't know if they actually worked paintings after the fact. And because some of Monet's paintings are encrusted with paint, the, the Rouen uh, cathedral paintings are, are built up, built up, built up. That's not because he made mistakes or thought it would be better, but it was an effect he was going for of the optics of the light. Absolutely. And maybe Churchill was feeling that too, that he could build up the colors because when you see them in life, reproductions never quite give off the, the, what the painting is and you see the greys and the colours yeah. because it was another thing that Clementine didn't like were the gaudy colours and she liked him to grey the colours a la Nicholson, yeah. William Nicholson. Yeah. And, and, but he loved bright colour but he did actually grey his colours and I think he was successful in creating at least in some works that notion of a kind of shimmering light that dances on the ocean he did with water, you're right, it's, absolutely. It's I noticed that in it. many paintings, he, he really, he worked the canvas and maybe that is one example where he would keep going back and and and, and he actually, his waters, I think he loved water. I, I read something, Norman um, McGowan, one of the 
uh, that's where I got a lot of information. If you read the valet, the detective, yeah. <laughs> they had that insight into where he was going, what he was thinking, because they were physically setting things up. Yeah. But he was obsessed with water, the pond, the lake, everything that he built. Where he loved water, whether it was, I don't know whether he felt calm around it, but certainly in painting, he painted it a lot and he captured it very well. So light and water, I think, bring us on to um, um, another question, I, I think. I mean, because I think light and water is uh, are some of the elements clearly that attract him to the south of France um, in particular. Marty Ancino from California um, wants to know if Churchill ever painted in the United States, um, to which the answer is, is yes, but but not very often, I think. There are um, a couple of paintings from Miami Beach in 1946, and, and there may be one or two others. Um, but I wonder if we can turn that question around slightly and say, and, and just ask you to expand, Paul, on, on what you think it was about the south of France in particular that, that kept bringing him back. Well, when I've looked at all the paintings that he'd done in England and or Italy, he painted a lot. The south of France rivals Great Britain. He really definitely painted a lot down here. I think it was an element of escapism from uh, holidays and running. He did work down here. He, he wrote a lot. And when the weather was bad, he would write. But it was very much a place that he would come for a relaxation. And often it's easy to get to. But the most important, the sun shining, and he loved that, uh, the scenes. I mean, it, 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 it was perfectly conducive to painting outside. So I think that's why he painted so much down here. And pres presumably he's on holiday in the south of France or, or yeah, tends to be, whereas the, the United States was come together. Work. He has time, he's got this beautiful subject, he's compelled to paint. Uh, and uh, all of those reasons, it's a perfect, perfect environment for him in that but, regard. That's, Sorry, Paul. There's, there's also a variety of subjects, isn't there? And we see that yeah. in his paintings. At right. one moment, we're looking at, at the sea sparkling along the coastline, and another, we're standing in the, the shade of a, a villa or chateau looking out. I mean, yeah. there's, there's hills in the background. There's, there's, there's sort of there's boats and houses that appear yeah. in some. So, I mean, it's endless, isn't it? The, the fascination. He, he would go inland and in. In the book, I've tried to give a, a, a wide variety. The beautiful Pont de Gare, when you go there and you see it, I mean, he's nailed it in this, book, this painting that he did. You, it's phenomenal. And many of the locations had changed in that the trees had grown. I was actually surprised, but I couldn't see some of the views, like in Avignon, the Palais de Pape. I had to go over the top of the tower that he painted at the base of because I couldn't see what he'd seen. They must have used it for firewood at the time. But um, uh, foliage had grown a lot. But I tried, he did go inland along the coast and he was, it was whatever, he, wherever he was and whatever caught his eye. And, and did you learn anything from standing where he stood? So there's the idea that you go there as an artist, you find the place and you think, well, that seems to be the obvious place. That's the most picturesque. And, and as he said with the red rocks, actually what he does is turn to a completely different view. What can we extrapolate yeah. from that about his practice as a painter? I don't know. I, I genuinely, apart from he's challenging himself again, a little bit like the Fauve element, he's thinking, this is what I want to paint. Mm. Because many of his paintings are the obvious. They're the, almost the amateur, that's what I'll paint. And it's, it's the cookie box, you know, yeah. cover. But there are times where he really paints an unusual, challenging subject. The pergola is a beautiful subject, quite challenging at Villa Silvia. And it's another one of my favorites, Patrick, if I were to choose one. I'll choose, I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, uh, the, I, I think they go beyond sometimes this bourgeois, beautiful scenes. Uh, he did, I, I've read somewhere that he just painted within the walls of these safe places where he was. He didn't, he went out he, yeah. into the countryside and he was among the population. He didn't like to be bothered, apparently. He, apart from children and animals, they could come up, but he didn't <laughs> like to be bothered by anybody. And uh, he was focused on his painting. But you're right, he did choose a wide variety. There is a, a lot of interest um, out there in um, l locations and what you said about your, your hunting for locations and discovering the locations. Um, so, for example, Joe's very interested in um, the process that you went through to sort of hunt down those locations and also um, whether you met many local people who could remember seeing Churchill painting at those yes. locations. That's a lovely question. Who asked the question? Joe. 
Joe, Joe, well, there are many elements I use. Obviously, the new technology of Google Earth and computers being, you know, a boom. Uh, old postcards I use, but it, it's, I miss, I don't know whether the CIA are hiring, but I really visually can see things. <laughs> that I, I don't know why my eye goes to it. And to be honest, even when I've shown people what I found, they still question it. And I'm thinking, why can't you see this? And so it's, it, 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 I think your eye, like your ear with music or anything else becomes attuned. So I use many elements. And then when I'm on the location, it's incredible how many times I've bumped into people, very old people that come up to me and have met him or saw him painting or saw him having lunch. And I met one lovely lady at um, uh, Restaurant Philippe in uh, the Fontaine de Vaucluse. She was 94 and she'd served him. She was in her early 20s. They were in the restaurant. And I asked her what he liked to eat. And she said he was a real gourmand. He loved the menu. He would eat off the menu and he loved particularly the trout. <laughs> but I loved that she met him and, and was there. So that's a, a, it was a nice element of doing this book. So we're running out of time, but Barry, any last thoughts for, for Paul? Actually, I was, going to, I was going to put Paul on the spot a little bit by saying, did any of the works elude your detective work? I mean, yeah. yeah. There's a section in the book where I'm know. actually hoping maybe people can say to me, <laughs> because it might be obvious to them, but I quite like that. It's almost like a, a book that's, uh, it, that can go on. And it's not something that's finished, like you said earlier. That this is, it, it, and, and this is a pet project for me. But anybody takes up the gauntlet and finds it's wonderful. It's just like a big puzzle that we're putting the pieces together. But yes, there there were quite a few that are very frustrating. And um, I'm just glad I've, I've I've got over 40 so far, way more than 40. And they're not just of the south of France, but these are this is the bulk that were not known. But it's wonderful to actually have done this. I feel very proud in, in that regard, in a small way. And rightly proud. I think it's an incredible achievement, Paul. Thank Absolutely. Really well and let's see if this conversation leads to some emails about hitherto unknown Churchill paintings. <laughs> um, I hope so. The Churchill Paintings Group awaits. Um, well, gentlemen, thank you both very, very much. That's been an absolutely riveting um, conversation. Um, it certainly got me thinking about Churchill's painting in a new way. And I'm, I'm, I'm particularly struck, actually, by what you said um, about the way in which taking up painting may have had an impact on Churchill's character, his psyche, and therefore ultimately on, on his professional and, and public life. And that, that's something I think that you know, myself and others would, would certainly be interested in exploring. So thank you for bringing us so much colour um, and warmth and, and, and an engagement um, to this session. Um, we're now going to move to another break, but before we do, we have a further quiz question. But this one is a little bit different, because unlike the previous one, this is for a prize. So we want you to email in the answer to 2020 at winstonchurchill.org. And three correct answers drawn at random tomorrow um, at the beginning of the final session of the conference will each win a copy of Paul's wonderful book. And, and given what we've just heard and given the film that we've seen, I'm sure that we're going to be getting hundreds, if not thousands of emails. So this is, this is your chance to, to, to get the book now. So the question, which is now um, appearing in hopefully your quiz screen, um, is what was the subject of the most expensive Churchill painting sold at auction? What was the subject of the most expensive Churchill painting sold at auction? So we're not going to be giving you the answer to that today. We want you to email in. We will be drawing the winners tomorrow. We now head into our next break. And that we, we're keeping with an art-related theme, a painting-related theme. We're now going to show two related pieces of pre-recorded footage, both from the other side of the Atlantic. We're going to start with a short video piece from Edwina Sands, Churchill's granddaughter, herself an accomplished artist and sculptor. And that's going to be followed by some remarks made at a 2018 event in Dallas by former US President George W. Bush on how Churchill inspired him to take up his own paintbrush. And we're grateful to the president for allowing us to show that footage here. So rejoin us 
for the next session on the relevance and legacy of Churchill today, chaired by Jonathan Dimbleby in about 15 minutes time. Thank you. Hello, I'm Edwina Sands. People often ask me, was your grandfather Winston Churchill a good painter? I always answer emphatically, yes, he was a good painter because he painted what he loved. He loved his garden at Chartwell. He loved the black swans on the lake. In particular, he loved the goldfish pond. I remember him throwing flakes into the water, delighting at the golden flashes that leapt to the surface, as if from nowhere. He was the only artist I ever met. I remember as a child standing behind him, watching as he put magic on the canvas. This is Finer Stars, a painting I've made of my grandfather at the easel. Grandpapa is in black and white, surrounded by colored books. All the books are either by him or about him. In the foreground are some of his favorite things. The painting within the painting on the easel is one of my favorites. Let me show you a little closer. He loved painting outdoors. He loved painting landscapes seascapes, skyscapes, scapes of all sorts. This painting he called Bottlescape. I think it must have been raining that day, otherwise he would have been painting outside in the garden. The canvas still hangs at Chartwell and it sums up for me his love of life. See the fine array of decanters and bottles some opened see the disarray of half-filled glasses. It is quite loosely painted, but you know exactly what each bottle holds and what it tastes like. Bottlescape evokes with Proustian certainty the familiar scent of the cedar wood cigar boxes stacked up on the side. Rich reds and browns, bold white highlights on all the shiny objects, the table lamp with the orange shade all cast a warm glow over the whole scene. Was Winston Churchill a good painter? Though I'm biased as a judge, I did hear once that Pablo Picasso said of him, that man could have made a good living as an artist if he had not had so many other things to do. At any rate, I've really been looking forward to this because I am a uh, big admirer of Winston Churchill to the point where in the Oval Office I had his bust uh, loaned uh, by Tony Blair. And so I looked at Churchill on a daily basis and often thought about his courage, his uh, humor, his command of the English language, which... Wasn't my long suit. <laughs> you know, it's an amazing period uh, to think about uh, England battling Adolf Hitler and the United States tepid to engage. It's kind of a reminder of why isolationism is dangerous for the world. I hope our fellow citizens, as we think through uh, what's happening today, think about the lessons of history. Fortunately, uh, the relationship between Roosevelt and Churchill was ironclad and necessary for peace. A reminder of how, about how important the relationship with England is for the United States. The other reason why I've been looking forward to this is because I was inspired by Churchill the painter. Uh, for those of you who don't know the story, I was a little antsy 
for a while. I mean, we're very much engaged here at the Bush Center. Uh, and I'm giving a fair number of speeches. Uh, used to believe in free speech. Uh, <laughs> but it wasn't enough. By chance, I read uh, a little essay by Winston Churchill called Painting as a Pastime, which, by the way, are on sale out there in the lobby. I'm told this is the only place where you can purchase a hardback copy of the, of the, of the essay. It's, it's really inspiring, at least it was for me. In essence, I said to Laura, if Churchill can paint, I can paint. And she said, I don't think so. And so I, I, I started painting, and I've been painting every day since for six years, all because of the inspiration of Winston Churchill. He, uh, I, I think he was a fine painter. Uh, I uh, wanted to honor his uh, influence on me by painting a series of uh, Churchill paintings. Uh, I painted five studies. For the uninitiated, the study is the smaller painting in preparation for painting uh, this large painting. It's a different, it's a different, uh, requires a different set of skills. The smaller paintings are, you know, you can move pretty quickly. The larger paintings, it's like the nose is a portrait unto itself. <laughs> and and uh, I really enjoyed painting Churchill. I painted him with a lot of affection. I thought about the, the character of the man I thought about his influence in history. Uh, I thought about how much I admired him, and I hope my paintings uh, reflect that.
Well, welcome back to the final session of day one. We've explored leadership. We've delved into painting. We want to end our first day by returning to politics and drilling deep into Churchill's relevance and legacy today. So please keep emailing those questions to 2020 at winstonchurchill.org. Um, we've been thrilled by the numbers watching this today, um, consistently up at around the two and a half thousand mark, which is absolutely fantastic. So do stay tuned. And I'm now going to hand over to Derek Greenwell, chair of the International Churchill Society Conference Committee, to set the context for our next panel and introduce our chairman. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the next session, which is panel discussion entitled Churchill's Legacy and Relevance Today. He certainly continues to appear prominently in the newspapers and is quoted by politicians across the whole political spectrum in aid of their platforms, something I suspect he would rather have liked. But when we look around the globe today, what role has he played in shaping our globe? How would he be remembered? What lessons does the study of his life hold for generations that do not remember the Second World War? We've assembled an expert panel to answer these and other questions, but the panel is only as good as its chair, and we have the very best. Jonathan Dimbleby is a man already known to many of you, having taken part in the last UK conference in Oxford. He's one of the UK's foremost broadcasters. He's the son of Richard Dimbleby, who you may remember was the commentator for the BBC at the funeral of Sir Winston. His career began at the BBC in Bristol in 1969, and was one of the first programmes he covered was the expulsion of the Asians from Uganda under Idi Amin. He's written and presented a number of remarkable programmes one on the final years of the British rule in Hong Kong, and one memorable one on Prince Charles, in which Prince Charles spoke about his first marriage and his relationship with his now wife, Camilla Parker Bowes. From 1987 to 2019, he was the voice of the flagship current affairs programme, Any Questions, on BBC Radio 4. In recent years, he's established himself as an expert on the history of the Second World War, having published The Battle of the Atlantic and Destiny in the Desert. And he's currently writing on Operation Barbarossa, the German invasion of Russia. But this has only briefly touched on this man's talents, interests, programs and writings. We are incredibly fortunate to have him to join us down the line from Bristol today on behalf of the International Churchill Society, we thank you, Jonathan, for agreeing to take part in this section of the programme. It's immensely reassuring to know that this session is in such safe hands. And now I will hand over to Jonathan to introduce the panel who are taking part in this fascinating topic this afternoon. Derek, thank you for your overly generous introduction. Churchill in Adversity is the title of the conference, as we know, of, of this, of this uh, conference. And this session is Churchill's relevance and legacy, especially pertinent in the year which saw both the 75th anniversary of VE Day and the 75th anniversary of VJ Day, along with the despoliation, the vandalism of Churchill's statue in Parliament Square. Everyone has their own image of Churchill. Mine is coloured by writing about him in the context of appeasement and the Second World War, but perhaps more intimately by a photo of my father taken in 1945 in Berlin when he was following just behind Churchill as the great man walked through the destroyed capital of Germany. And he was a few feet behind and he was mistaken uh, for one of the great men's, the great man's son, Randolph, and appeared in the newspaper accordingly, which caused him great entertainment. And later that day, 20 years on, in January 65, when Churchill was awarded the rare honour of a full state funeral, Big Ben muted, silent crowds, a million people lining the streets, 
and the only sounds, the muffled steps of the servicemen bearing the coffin to St. Paul's Cathedral on the gun carriage. Beethoven's funeral march. And every 90 seconds, the distant roar of a single cannon from Hyde Park to mark every one of Churchill's 94 years, 94 times. Dignitaries from around the world, some of them ghosts from the past. And the queen breaking with precedent, leading the mourners, her message to his widow, Clemmy, the whole world is the poorer by the loss of his many-sided genius. As Derek mentioned, my father, who also died, it happens in that year, was the BBC's television commentator on that occasion. And he was uh, the unchallenged master of his class, craft, though I say it. But I shan't forget the moment when his quiet voice, surely reflecting the feelings of millions of people, not only in Britain, but around the world, as he described the moment that the coffin disappeared into Waterloo Station on its way to the village of Bladen, where he was to be buried. And he said, and his voice was breaking, very rarely breaking, quivering, as he said, we shall not, we shall not see it again. So what is his legacy? What is his relevance? To discuss this, a quartet of serious luminaries, luminaries in this field, Lord Boateng, Karen von Hippel, Rear Admiral Chris Parry, Dr. Chris Parry, and Professor Andrew Roberts. And they're going to speak for about three minutes each, then we'll have a discussion, and then it'll be opened up for you to participate. If you do want to do that, please send in any questions briefly um, by email. Um, to kick off, um, Andrew Roberts, first class honours degree, I'm just going to give you, I could do very long CVs for everyone, but here is briefish. First class honours degree in modern history uh, to Gonville and Gaius College in Cambridge, Guy, now an honorary scholar there, visiting professor at the War Studies Department at King's College in London, the Lehrman Institute lecturer at the New York Historical Society. He's written or edited, written most of them, 19 books translated into no less than 23 languages. His most recent is the widely acclaimed, and it was a best-selling biography, is of Sir Winston Churchill, Churchill Walking with Destiny. He's a member of the board and International Council of the International Churchill Society. Andrew, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jonathan. It's a great honour to be invited to uh, address you. Um, it strikes me that this is the year that Churchill has been in adversity. As you mentioned, his statue was vandalised in Parliament Square, not once, but twice. And so I think what the International Churchill Society desperately needs to do uh, is to um, argue back, is to fight back, is to point out that Black Lives Matter to Churchill. That's why he was up on the northwest frontier risking his life. That's why he fought against slavery in the Sudan. That's why throughout his life he protected the um, people of South Africa from the Afrikaners there. I think it's something we need to point out again and again. I think the way in which the National Trust tried to link Chartwell into slavery was a, a disgrace. I think that um, we've got to fight back on the lies that are told about him about the Bengal famine. So as far as I'm concerned, it's very important for the ICS to be proactive in his defence. Thank you. Um, we'll go on straight away then. If, if the, you could add, if you wish, but we, otherwise we'll go on to Karen von Hippel. Karen. You need to be unmuted, Karen. <laughs> the story of our lives. Anyway, thank you so much for inviting me to join you today. It's a pleasure to be here pleasure to partner with the International Churchill Society and Alan Packwood, as well as our wonderful trustee, Lawrence Geller. Thank you, Lawrence, for your kind words earlier. Um, I guess what I wanted to, to say, uh, I wanted to start by really talking about the legacy of leadership today. And uh, this is really an area where I think, unfortunately, there isn't much of a legacy. I think at the moment, we're seeing a dearth of inspired ethical leadership at the global level, some some leader or leaders who can speak across borders, across barriers, and inspire us, inspire all of us, not just a few people. And that's something obviously that we know Churchill did so well. Um, if anything, we have the opposite today. We have more of a leadership vacuum, um, and and we have a leadership vacuum at a time when we're facing so many really critical challenges, whether it's the rise of China as a superpower that, you know, that offers a very different governance model, uh, whether it's a revanchist interfering Russia, 
uh, other countries in a similar mode. We are dealing with hybrid threats that uh, Dr. Chris Perry can talk about in more detail. Um, and of course, we're facing this global pandemic. And all of these challenges are challenges that we cannot manage on our own. No country can manage these on our own. So just at a time when we desperately need partnerships and alliances, and especially leadership, we have a vacuum. And partially this is because the US has withdrawn from its traditional role that it, you know, that it has held since the end of the Second World War. I think Lord Haig and John Major, Sir John Major discussed that earlier. Um, and we're really suffering the consequences uh, of this. Uh, I think we're seeing more fragmentation globally, more nationalism, more xenophobia. We've seen authoritarian countries uh, able to uh, really commit grave human rights abuses, whether it's with the, the Uyghurs in the detention camps in Xinjiang in China, or uh, you know the attempted poisoning of the Russian opposition leader, Alexei Navalny, recently in Russia, the disgusting and hard dismemberment of, of the journalist Khashoggi uh, and the Saudi journalist Khashoggi in, in, in Turkey. So all of these actions have been happening with very little international outcry. Now, I know that uh, some people think leadership, leaderless organizations and leaderless protests are, um, are you know, they've become quite trendy in this uh, globalized, uh, socially, social media connected world that we're living in. Um, but personally, I am a great believer in leadership and I think it's so important. And I personally, like many of us on this panel, I suspect I've seen it in action in my own experiences working in the US government uh, when I was uh, involved in the counter ISIL coalition, uh, you know, a few years ago. So I think for me, the legacy of leadership, uh, that's what I would decry as a vacuum in leadership at the global level. I do think there are inspiring leaders out there, but right now they're, they're leaders of smaller countries like New Zealand. And it doesn't mean we can't get back to that kind of leadership later. And perhaps we can talk about that later. So I'll try to finish my three minutes now, but thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Karen. And I'm doing that. I'm going to have to do that thing that they do very irritatingly on the radio when you listen to music, is they don't tell you what the music is in advance. They tell you afterwards. So you spend most of the time listening, wondering what it was you listened to, thinking you know, but not being quite certain and very often being wrong. So I'm going to back reference you, as they say. Um, you are a graduate of Yale, of Yale, Oxford and the LSE, high flyer at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington. You were at the UN and the EU in Somalia and Kosovo, and you've had direct experience of some two dozen conflict zones. As you said, in the US Department of State, you're in senior positions, um, um, uh, notably as uh, the Chief of Staff to General John Allen, who was Special Presidential Envoy for the Global Coalition to Counter ISIL. Um, thank you. Next, Paul Boateng. You were born in London. You spent much of your childhood in Ghana, became a civil rights lawyer, turned an MP, the first black cabinet minister, um, subsequently British ambassador to South Africa, and you now chair or about to chair the Sir Winston Churchill Archive Trust. Paul. Yes, it's a great honor uh, to be chair uh, of, of the trust. This great archive, what, uh, 3,000 boxes, more than a million pieces of, pieces of paper that give you a sense of the richness, the complexity uh, of this man and and his life, uh, and for me uh, as a uh, as a lawyer and and a politician, uh, when words and rhetoric are one's stock in trade, the legacy uh, of uh, Sir Winston Churchill is this mastery uh, of uh, of those of those arts, uh, the recognition of the importance in politics uh, of history. And to a very large extent today, I fear uh, in global leadership, there isn't always that appreciation uh, of history uh, that would enable us to get out of some of the scrapes that a failure to understand the complexity uh, of a variety of situations that concern us in the world today has led us to make some profoundly wrong decisions. And that's nowhere more true uh, than uh, in, in, the middle, in the Middle East. So, uh, Words, uh, rhetoric, uh, the command uh, of those things are written in the spoken and the spoken word, and in the importance of us understanding uh, what it is and what goes in to making uh, a a great leader uh, for good and and ill. 
and when I reflect about my own imperson personal engagement uh, with uh, Winston Churchill, actually it comes very much from my own childhood, which you referred to in uh, Ghana and, and the Gold Coast. My father uh, was uh, a committed anti-imperialist, a lawyer and then a minister in the Freedom Party, uh, the Convention People's Party uh, in Ghana. And he possessed, and I could, I could see it now and hear it, now he possessed uh, a, a, a stock of records of Sir Winston, and I can see that the white there were white LPs with blue white covered LPs with blue in the middle, and he would play them. He would play them because words were his business too, both as a barrister and as a politician. And although he was fundamentally opposed, obviously to the imperialism that characterized Winston Churchill's approach uh, to, to empire and, and, and politics. He recognized a master when he heard one. A and politicians, generations of them, since uh, Sir Winston, uh, have used and appropriated his name, his skills. And that applies certainly if you look at transatlantic politicians. But in fact, it goes, it goes beyond that. Uh, and I, I, I found when I was in South Africa, a very interesting example of that in the two quite distinct approaches of Thabo Mbeki on the one hand and Nelson Mandela on the other, and I knew them both. Thabo made a very powerful speech in the Sudan in which he talked about the baleful influence actually uh, of Churchill and the imperial vision on the relationships uh, between Britain, the West, uh, and, and Africa. Uh, and you know, Tabo spoke, uh, as he always did and does, with a great deal of, of, of erudition and truth. But then if you look, and I really commend this to folks who are interested in the impact of Churchill over the years, if you then look at Nelson Mandela's autobiography, he refers specifically to the Atlantic Charter uh, signed by Churchill and Roosevelt, the promise it made of freedom and emancipation for all peoples and the importance uh, of that. And he says how it inspired him as a young lawyer and as a young politician struggling for freedom in South Africa, because it gave him a moral basis to fight that fight against uh, uh, the Boers, against uh, uh, apartheid at, the, at that time. Now, I doubt that that was uh, Churchill's necess necessary intention. It wasn't his, his main focus in signing the, the Atlantic Charter, but it was something that proved to be enormously useful. So the point that I, that I would make is that the legacy of Churchill is the way that he speaks into the human condition, into politics, into history and therefore is as relevant uh, today uh, as, as he was, uh, what, 60, uh, 60 odd years, uh, 60 odd years ago. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's worth uh, uh, reflecting on. And that's the value uh, of the archive and indeed of archives globally. Oh, thank you. Um, Rear Admiral Dr. Chris Parry, um, read modern history at Oxford, Spent 36 years in the Royal Navy, aviator and warfare officer who sailed in every ocean, served in Northern Ireland, Gulf, Falklands, where you were mentioned in dispatches. Then as Rear Admiral, you were responsible for determining the future strategic context operations and for shaping the conceptual development of all three armed forces up to the year 2030. Now you've got your own strategic forecasting company, you advise governments, leading commercial companies and banks about strategic issues, um, high level leadership and systemic risk. Over to you. Well, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, and thank you uh, to my colleagues uh, uh, for allowing me to accompany you. Um, very simply, I think uh, that Churchill is a universal exemplar to all of us today. He's a great hero. He's a Renaissance man. He was a politician, a soldier, a writer, an artist, a performer, and also a family man, and not necessarily in, in that order. 
And I think uh, that what he tells us today is in the face of totalitarian ideologies in his day, fascism and communism, in our day today, some of the things that Karen mentioned, uh, he brought to the table some really unfashionable values today, duty, honor, sacrifice, an ethical approach, decency, integrity, patriotism, inspirational leadership, and of course, a, a sense of mission. How often do we hear those words today? They're not words that I ever see on Twitter. More than anything, he brought a sense of commitment and purpose. Never give in, never give in, never, 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 never. In nothing, great or small, large or petty, never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. And it's a sign, I think, of his eminence that everybody knows something about Churchill and what in general uh, he stood for. And there's this vague idea in Britain, certainly in around the Commonwealth, that if things are getting tough, then somehow uh, Churchill in some form will be resurrected to come and help us just as he did uh, in 1940, whether it's Churchill himself or somebody posing as Churchill, of course. Uh, what I thought I'd like to say as a basis for discussion, we're talking about adversity and as a military man, I want to talk about Churchill in war and aligning his capabilities to the 10 uh, principles of war today, something we use today all the time, is very interesting. I'm going to tell you about the top four because it's very closely aligned to Churchill's skills. He's pretty good at all the others too. Uh, the only area I would fault him is in the area of flexibility, uh, where he really did stick his neck in and keep it there. But let's have a look. Top, uh, the top principle of warfare. Okay, selection and maintenance of the aim. What did he say? His aim was, I have only one purpose, the destruction of Hitler, and my life is simplified thereby. If Hitler invaded hell, I would make at least a favorable reference to the devil in the House of Commons. Next one, maintenance of morale, okay? And uh, his first directive to all civil servants and military men was, the prime minister expects all his majesty's servants in high places to set an example of steadiness and resolution. And his soaring rhetoric, his eloquence, his writing, and of course, Kennedy said he actually mobilized the English language and sent it into battle. And he wrote 43 book length works in 72 volumes. He wrote more than Dickens uh, and Shakespeare combined. Quite extraordinary. And then you go on to his personal engagement, his self-belief, his clarity of purpose, his basic emotional patriotism and appeal to Britain's place in history. And frankly, he channeled the past. Drake, Marlborough, Nelson, Wellington, Cromwell and Napoleon, they're all in there. Uh, and his history of the English speaking peoples, even today, can unite all those who speak English or who have English as part of their culture. And he said, you know, it was the nation and the race dwelling around the globe that had the lion's heart. I had the luck to be called upon to give the roar. I also hope that I sometimes suggested to the lion the right place to use his claws. Third principle of war, offensive action. And this is something Churchill uh, was absolutely remarkable for. He didn't always get it right, we know that, but it was a constant feature of his fighting mentality, what Ismay called his warrior culture. It prevents the enemy re uh, retaining the initiative. It makes him react. And we know that 300,000 troops were left in Norway simply on the off chance that Churchill will continue raiding along that coast and invade. He was ruthless when necessary, when the French fleet was destroyed at Iran. And we all know, I think, action this day, this high energetic personal style that got things done. And the fourth uh, most important, cooperation. We saw the grand coalition that he put together to defeat uh, Germany, Italy, and Japan. And his relationship with Franklin D. Roosevelt was at the heart of that. Within this country, he exerted national leadership. He not only brought together his cabinet colleagues and the other parties, he communicated by minute and telegrams worldwide. And while fighting political battles at home, uh, he actually brought allies abroad uh, together. Now, those are the four top things. He, I could go through sustainability, security, surprise, which is another thing that he was good at, particularly with technology, concentration of force, economy of effort, uh, and finally, flexibility. But the one thing I want to stress is not on the uh, principles of war, but it was at the heart of his humanity. And that is a peculiar British principle of warfare that never appears. And that is a sense of humor. 
in adversity, one thing Brits and Churchill were brilliant at was bringing a sense of humour uh, to bring any situation uh, down to earth and make it realisable. Thank you. Thank you. A very rich portrait and four uh, perspectives, um, all of which bear closer examination. Let's start with what, what um, uh, Andrew, you said in very passionate terms that he was and illustrated why he was not a racist. I wonder whether the, what happens easily is, a, is a, an elision of two different things, racism and imperialism, because it's clear he was an imperialist and during the war, there were very few who were not imperialists. Britain had a huge empire in which there was complete control. It, nonetheless, if you some of his attitudes, perhaps uh, his attitude towards Gandhi is not the, the attitude of one individual who happens to hold power towards another who doesn't happen to hold power. There wasn't air, some a, a sort of air of superiority, was there not at the very least? I think with Gandhi, of course, you've got to remember that he was leading the movement to try to get the British to quit India. It was a it was a, a tough political battle. And uh, if you look all the way through Churchill's life, he was fantastically rude about his political opponents, completely regardless of uh, the colour of skin. When you see some of the, uh, the brilliant put downs in the House of Commons uh, over 60 years almost, um, you appreciate that uh, his attacks on Gandhi were not any, time, any way uh, more um, vicious or aggressive than ones that he had uh, directed towards lots of other people. Now, that doesn't mean he didn't make um, uh, racist epithets, or at least what today we would call racist epithets, that were completely unacceptable in, uh, in any kind of uh, society today. He did. Um, the important thing, though, is to appreciate not only just that, of course, he was born at the same time that Charles Darwin was still alive and that most people uh, did believe in a hierarchy of races, however, um, however despicable and ludicrous that might appeal, that might might uh, an obscene indeed that that might seem to us today. However, actually, he went on to do things for the non-white, um, the native peoples of the empire that an awful lot of other people um, would not have done. He actually went; he put his own life on the line, uh, time after time, to try and make the. Uh, the um, life of the native peoples of the empire better. Hang on a minute. Was he doing that, or was he doing it in order to secure Britain's imperial control over those places? Well, the, the, and, you know, I, there is a distinction. No, there, there's no distinction. There's no distinction at all. If you're if you've got uh, Afridi and Taliban um, tribesmen coming down to destroy the uh, the um, the Punjab then you are protecting the people of the Punjab at the same time as protecting the British Empire because the Punjab's in the British Empire. It's well, a Paul, impossibility. Well, sorry. This, is what, this is one of the mistakes, I think, that, um, that Black, Black Lives Matter and other um, people make, is to try to assume that because he's an imperialist, therefore, uh, he in some way looks down on the uh, native peoples of the empire. He doesn't at all. He wants them to thrive. He boasts constantly throughout his career about how many there are and how, how many more um, are being born all the time. Um, Paul, you talked about being brought up in Ghana and your, and your father, and, and then in, uh, in South Africa, the competing views of, of, of church. Um, which do you find the, 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 the most persuasive? Are you with Andrew on this, that, that he was clearly not racist in any identifiable way, although he used terms that would be today intolerable, but he was an imperialist and that led to certain actions and decisions and speeches. I'm not sure really how fruitful a debate this, this is. Um, but it, 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 is, it, is, it is quite I, fruitful in part, sorry, it's fruitful if Andrew is right in saying there has to be a fight back on this, if, we, if his legacy is to I'm, be protected. I'm, I'm, so I, I think we can value what Winston Churchill represented as a great war leader. Uh, we can value his skill, his mastery of language, at the same time as deprecating some of his attitudes. The two things are not inconsistent. Andrew wouldn't deny uh, that he believed, uh, and all his writings and speeches reveal it, he believed that the white races had a duty 
uh, to quotes unquote civilize those non-white races. That's what he believed. And I, I don't see any point in beating about the bush in relation to that. That was his belief. Uh, but at the same time, the reality was that when uh, some South African freedom fighters, as I would see them, uh, were sent uh, into uh, exile as uh, on an on an unhospitable and unpleasant island as home secretary he argued for an improvement in their conditions that's also a fact none of those things are inconsistent uh, we are we are where we are and i think it's unfortunate to somehow suggest that the black lives matter movement has taken again uh, Winston Churchill. The fact of the matter is that Winston Churchill has throughout the ages on all sides, on, on all, while he was alive and when he was dead, on all sides of the political line, right and left, been, uh, been a source of controversy. Peregrine Worsthal of a blessed memory because he was someone I knew, I argued against, but also had a great deal of time for. We spent time together. Paul, just Pero a second, Paul, just a second. For those who are watching all around the world, even though he was a famous and distinguished British journalist, um, uh, he was the editor of a newspaper and he holds, held strong, and you might describe them as sort of quasi-imperial views of the world. Yes, and, uh, but he took the view uh, that Churchill was unnecessarily bellicose, described him as a, uh, as a warmonger. I personally don't happen to, to, to have that view. But let's not pretend that he hasn't always been a source of controversy. He has. Uh, during the time when I was in government and police minister, we were always very concerned about attacks uh, on his statue. That had nothing whatsoever to do with, with the Black Lives Movement. He was always a contentious figure. His views on Gandhi were utterly uh, wrong, wrong headed and mistaken and not shared by many in his, in his own party. And for me, I think it's, it's very interesting if, if we're focusing on this on this Gandhi Churchill issue. Um, they, he only ever met him, as I understand it, once. Uh, and they avoided each other very much thereafter for very, for very understandable reasons. Uh, but there's a wonderful uh, picture uh, uh, of, uh, the, uh, of the Mahatma visiting the UK. Uh, when uh, Churchill uh, was railing uh, uh, against him. And the Mahatma is being cheered to the skies by Lancashire women who were working in the cotton, in, in the cotton mills. And those same uh, uh, women were the women who, after the war, despite Churchill's great achievements in the war, voted overwhelmingly for something new, for, for labor, uh, as did the vast majority of the armed forces, because they saw in Churchill, although a great war leader, a deep-rooted reactionary. The two things are not inconsistent. Let us then come to the complexity of the world as you outlined it, uh, Karen. And um, Chris spoke very eloquently about the range of qualities and skills that he had. Um, and you, you left open the question of, of how he would fit into that highly complex, complex multipolar world. Um, do you have a view about, about that or about, if you take it specifically, um, he, 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 he virtually created, cemented, argued for the special relationship with the United States. Uh, you said the leadership is virtually gone from the United States, is withdrawn from these critical issues. And, um, that was a very special time that he was in that position. Um, can you, you can you imagine a role for him, that particular kind of person today, in your search for leaders? I, yeah, I, I, how I, relevant is he today? I'll bring you in, in right. I mean, I think I think we are just going through a global swing. We have a, a number of populist leaders out there that are far more interested in really in oratory and nationalism than they are in really serving their people. And it's not just in the United States, obviously it's in India, Brazil, uh, Hungary. There are a number of countries where we have these populist leaders. Um, 
we have had inspiring leaders and in many ways, you could say President Obama was an amazing orator, you know, <clears throat> one of the, the best the US has had in some time. You could also argue that may, maybe his foreign policy didn't keep up with, uh, with his rhetoric, but he was certainly an outstanding, uh, he was uh, really outstanding in giving speeches. Um, and, uh, and, and the US just hasn't had that kind of inspiring leader in some time. I mean, when President Obama went to Berlin and spoke, you had thousands of Germans out there. Uh, Trump could not attract the same. And in fact, when Trump came to the UK, he attracted the opposite, he attracted protesters. Now, it's not, this is not to slam Trump, it's just that Trump has chosen to, to look inward and not to lead externally. Um, I'm not sure he fully believes in alliances and partnerships, et cetera, anyway. So I think, you know, I don't think, I think that a, a, a leader in the style of Churchill could come along in the future. And certainly the relationship between the US and the UK has always been a strong one and it has always outlived these bumps along the way, uh, it, it does bounce back, but at the okay. moment, and I, I, you know, I just- want, I, Sorry, sorry, Karen, I, I, I want to come back to that, that long lasting relationship and its pertinence today. But Chris, just coming on the extent to which a Churchillian figure, as you described him, uh, could actually handle the complexity, not, not intellectually, but whether he could handle politically and diplomatically the complexity of the relations um, in the world in which we now live. Very interesting. I always think that context uh, bring forward uh, people. I also have a worry as a historian that we always look at imperfect pass through the imperfect lens of the present. And I think there is a bit of that in, in, in all of this. Um, what we're seeing today, I think, yes. uh, it's a very interesting world in which we're connected but contested. Uh, and that's a situation we really faced after the Second World War. And we've got a situation where we have probably three Eurasian autocracies, Russia, China, and Iran, uh, probably facing now the maritime democracies, the United States, UK, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, India, uh, Singapore, uh, and uh, a number of other countries like Malaysia. And this is looking very much like a bamboo curtain is descending across the world. So you have these Eurasian autocracies uh, and these maritime democracies. And what is needed is to knit together essentially what is an English speaking maritime democratic bloc against a totalitarian uh, Eurasian bloc. And it seems to me that the person that can actually uh, knit that together to bring forward a new Atlantic charter uh, that can actually deal with this very complex situation is the person that we're looking for. Um, I don't think that person exists at the moment. And I think the evolution of the relationship, as I said, in this connected but contested world uh, will bring forward that person. But it is, is going to have to be somebody of the stature of Churchill uh, with his range of talents, abilities uh, uh, and things like that, if we are going to uh, essentially stop this block on block uh, world descending into uh, serious friction. Paul Boating. I think Chris is absolutely right about context. My worry is when I look at the state of leadership in the world today and what we have become, uh, is that I don't think that if we had a Churchill today, he would rise to the top of his party uh, and rise to become prime minister. We have no, uh, uh, we really don't know how Churchill would have survived, for instance, media scrutiny. Uh, you know, Churchill never had to put up with the likes of you, Jonathan. Uh, or, or indeed with the likes of uh, of your brother, or of Robin Day, or of Paxman, or of any of or, or any of the others. He never had any of that. We don't know how he would have survived. We know uh, too, uh, in terms of of context, that the passionate nature of the man, his willingness to say uh, and to own up to when he was wrong, to change his mind, these were all great qualities. Of, uh, of Churchill, he was willing to do that. Today, those are seen as signs of weakness in any politician. We will go to amazing lengths to appear not to have changed our mind upon anything, because to have done so uh, it is to condemn uh, you, yourself to mockery and ridicule. There's no way that someone who changed party twice uh, could become leader today. So we have that problem of context. There's no use 
in a, a, addressing the paucity of the world's leadership today to hope that a second Churchill will arise. That ain't going to happen. And there's one other real uh, concern uh, that I have in terms of qualities of leadership. One of the great qualities that Churchill had, apart from a profound sense about the importance of, of knowledge of history, uh, which is not seen as, a, as a necessarily as a qualification today, he had the great capacity to delegate. He was a very effective delegator. And if you look at his wartime premiership, he left whole sections of social policy, of industrial policy, to those who he thought were, uh, whether it was uh, Bevin or Beveridge, those who he thought, even though he was politically on a different side from them, better able to handle the situation. That's not what we see today in, in any uh, of the leaders of Western yeah. democracy, this ability to form alliances and to delegate. That's not what these men are known for. From what you said, so far, it raises, you've all said, it raises a sort of the question, how pertinent is Churchill today, except in so far as he demonstrates a range of personal characteristics and our great knowledge of, of his extraordinary performance during the Second World War. And let's look at that in the context of the special relationship, which I think, Karen, you said, um, would, uh, would had persisted through time. In that special relationship in the war, and Andrew has written about that, quite brilliantly um, in one of his books, Masters and Commanders, I think, if I'm right. Um, the, the, uh, he, he, Britain was a supplicant. Britain, above all else, needed America support to come into the war, dependent on, on the United States to keep life going in this country in the early years during the U-boat war. And then if we were going to protect Western interests in Europe against the possible rapacity of the Soviet Union after D-Day. Um, I put it crudely and simply to make that special relationship was clearly very real and it continued. But is it anything more than a sort of self-indulgence now uh, amongst the elite in both countries? Because it has no uh, uh, grounding in either the economic or real international diplomatic perspective of the competing countries of Europe, Britain, America and the rest of the world. Andrew, can you pick up on that? If I haven't given you too long-winded, a multifaceted question no, no, to answer. No, no, no. no not at all. Um, uh, well, I've I've read the obituary of many, many people who've written the obituary of the special relationship, and I don't believe that um, we uh, we don't have those things that you mentioned. I think we have, first of all, enormous investors in each other's country uh, companies and in uh, in both countries. We have an intelligence relationship, the five eyes, which is absolutely central to um, our security. We both have the um, nuclear technology that we swap with one another. We have the most fantastic um, history, of course, in, in the past, but also the language and the law and the sense of democracy and the things that, uh, that have bound us together uh, at the time that you were writing about in the Battle of the Atlantic. Um, we also have proved again and again that uh, there are people willing to, uh, to make the ultimate sacrifice for democracy. And so I think that um, it's very easy to poo-poo the special relationship and talk about the cases where it hasn't worked. But actually, underlying it all, as well, of course, as a lot as, as immense friendship with uh, individual Americans backwards and forwards across the Atlantic, this is something that goes beyond just pounds, shillings and pence. I think it's something that's real and it's something that matters to both uh, sides. And um, however many times uh, American politicians try to build up other partners, um, and we've seen it before with France and Germany and so on. Actually, when, it, when push comes to shove, they know that the people they can trust best are the British. And let me bring anyone else in with this simple I, question. Yeah. Everyone wants in. I'll come to you, Karen. Um, what difference does it make? Okay, the feeling is there. Who's going to come to whose support in terms that matter? Andrew, quickly, you answer it yourself. I can well, see you're bursting to. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, you just see it again and again when, when the two countries uh, go to war is, is uh, we help each other. Okay. Karen. I'll just be quick too, because, uh, you know, to me, the relationship is wide and it's very deep. And so it's not just five eyes, it's diplomats, it's military exchanges, it's civil servants, it's very, very close partnerships across governments and across civil society. And you don't need to be 
the same economic power, the same military power to work together in today's world. I mean, if we've seen Russia punching so far above its weight when you know its economy is probably on par with Italy. And so you can cause immense damage and you can also, uh, you can do a lot if you're a smaller power and a more agile power. So to me, it's less about military might or finance, it's about, or your economic might, it's about what, you know, being smart with what you have. Chris and then Paul. Chris. Very quickly, <clears throat> that um, coalition of maritime democracies that I mentioned, um, at its heart, uh, is not just the fact they're connected by the sea and they're all democracies, they all speak English. Uh, and this idea of uh, English uh, ways of democracy, of language, of thinking of law, is going to be un the underpinning of the free democracies in relation to the totalitarian states in future. And at the heart of that, of course, is the Atlantic Alliance. And as we speak in Queen Elizabeth, HMS Queen Elizabeth right now is the future Atlantic Alliance Forum. And that is reinforcing not only the special relationship, but as I trust in future, it will cement together this basic Anglosphere that will front up against the totalitarian regimes of Eurasia. You sound like a naval admiral, if I may say so. No, but the sea is the physical equivalent of the World Wide Web. If you want to be interested in globalization, you have to be at sea. Uh, remember, I, I had five joint jobs as well. <laughs> <laughs> Paul. Well, I think Chris Parr is absolutely right to mention the rule of law. Uh, that was at the heart of the Atlantic Charter. Nelson Mandela referred to that specifically in his critique of the Charter. And Karen talks about the importance of us being smart in this. And we do have to be smart. And we have to recognize too, that the special relationship, if it is to be made real and to deliver, not just to our respective peoples, but to the world, as it, in my view, did do, in the, second, in the Second World War, has to be based on honesty and respect and requires a great deal of heavy lifting. I mean, Churchill in his writings throughout, and, and the archive can demonstrate this, anyone who cares to go on to it digitally, Churchill throughout his lifetime did a great deal of the spade work in terms of his writing to build the special relationship, to cement the special relationship. He put a great deal of time and effort into forging personal relationships. And that has, and that has to be done and it has to be, has to be important. And you have to recognize you know, you're not always going to, going to agree. I mean, Truman and Churchill did not agree on a great deal. Eisenhower suggested uh, to uh, Churchill that he might make his, as it were, his swan song, he's going out of politics, he might make the movement for colonial freedom the, the, the basis of that, because Eisenhower recognized that the days of colonialism were coming to an end. Churchill regretted that, uh, um, rejected that, and said he was doubtful about the benefits of universal suffrage for the Hottentots, quotes unquotes. So, you know, they talk frankly to each other, and they did, they, they put the work and effort in. The question I have it today is whether or not uh, the likes, uh, and we, let's be frank about it, whether the likes of the current incumbent of the White House are prepared to put the degree of work and heavy lifting uh, uh, into, into that. I think British prime ministers in the main have been, uh, Although, you know, they've also talked truth unto power because power, there's a disbalance of power. The United States is a more powerful country than Great Britain. Wilson resisted that, resisted U.S. power, and despite our economic weakness, and didn't get dragged into the Vietnam War. We arguably succumbed to American power in relation to, uh, to, to Iraq. And we, Iraq, the world, the United States, Paid, paid a price for that. So I'm a great believer in the special relationship. I happen to believe that there are values that are transmitted in the English language uh, very well and in our constitutional respect for the rule of law, but we need to be true to that and to one another and to speak truth let's, to one another. Let's have a, a, a quick look. I want to quite soon bring in people who are watching, listening from elsewhere. Have a, have a quick look at, at the situation today. Um, well, there's seven days, I think, um, roughly till the 
American election. It could conceivably be a different uh, president who, who emerges. And everyone in my position when you're doing this remains absolutely neutral about what might be desirable under those circumstances. Um, I might express my views outside this forum. Um, the, the, uh, we also have uh, very soon uh, Britain transition period ends, Brexit takes its form either with or without some kind of deal. And the prime minister of the day in this country talks about effectively the brave new world that there will be after that, that Britain can sail the seas again, to use a kind of phrase that would please the, uh, the admiral. Um, others think it's catastrophic. So the point is, the United States is deeply divided. Britain is deeply divided on key issues. Um, let us pretend, as it were, or what kind of person, what kind of leadership in this divided world could help Britain emerge from the big dramas, you know, leave aside for the moment, if you like, the global impact of COVID-19, um, or included, if you wish. What is, how could Britain get out of this to play the kind of role that, that those of you who have been speaking rather aspire for Britain to have? Maybe it doesn't happen. Maybe it's self-delusion. Maybe maybe we are a small a small and declining power, and that we 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 fly on the American coattails. Jonathan, uh, the person that's going to emerge is somebody that has a vision and strategy for Britain that is based on a balance of values and interests. Uh, we're in a world now of competing empires again. Uh, we see the Chinese Empire on the rise, the Russian Empire trying to extend itself, even the Ottoman Empire. America is trying to hold its grip on the empire of the seas. So the legitimacy and uh, stability of countries, nation states, is going to be really important. But unless they have a strategy that transcends electoral politics, we will not actually be able to make our way in the world. Karen. Um, I, you know, I'm not sure. I think, look, I think if Trump wins, uh, we know what we're going to get for the next four years. If Biden wins, there won't be a return to business as usual because I think the world has changed and the US will need to rebuild trust with other countries. Um, but Biden does believe in partnerships and he does believe in alliances and he knows that the US can't do any of these things on its own. I mean, I don't know why Trump thought he could do China or make deals with China with only the US. You need to bring in other countries. Everyone has a similar interest in working with China but recognizing that it can also be a competitor or potentially a threat. Um, Paul, uh, Britain, look, Britain role in the world as we are now heading. What, Brit what, what Britain has and of great value in the world, it seems to me, is a history of relationships. Now, those relationships have not always been easy ones. Sometimes there have been trouble. Uh, the history is contested, but at least we have a history of relationships. The question is, are we going to use them effectively? Are, are, are we going to only see them through some sort of um, miasma uh, uh, that it, of in past imperial glory? Uh, we can recognize the empire as was, the Commonwealth as is, with its strengths and weaknesses, but build on those historical relationships. And trade will be essential to that because they, there is a global competition in trade. Let's not kid ourselves. Our, our markets uh, in, let me take Africa, which is the continent that I, kn I know best, our traditional markets in Africa are now looking more and more to the East, to uh, India, to Turkey, to China. We have, however, relationships that are built on an understanding and respect and a common language. We need to use those. If, so far as the United States is concerned, we shouldn't kid ourselves for one moment that we are going to find it easier to get a trade deal uh, if Donald, uh, whether, on, whether or not Donald Trump uh, is uh, the next president of the, uh, of the, of the United States. Whether, whether or not it's Democrat or Republican, basically it's always America and American interest first. That's understandable. That's how it is. And we have to recognize that. Uh, Brexit and the Irish question will loom large in the minds of Congress, whether Democrat or Republican. So we have to find a way uh, of, uh, of addressing that. And we have to address that 
by respect for the rule of law, by okay. respect for those, for those Atlantic Charter principles. And the current legislation uh, going through Parliament at this time uh, doesn't actually put the rule of law uh, at its heart. Otherwise, we would not have seen the resignations we have from, from the ruling party. So let's actually recognize the value of relationships, the rule of law, and let's be realistic about what we aspire to do. Andrew, before you come to a sort of broader point, I'm just curious whether you think, given your knowledge of the American administration, Trump, Churchill, we know Churchill's ability, his extraordinary diplomatic charm, as well as his other qualities of uh, intellectual thuggery, that he was able to forge a very good relationship with Roosevelt, with Truman, etc. Could he have forged a, a relationship with someone, how can I put it, as mercurial as Trump, of any coherent and useful kind from Britain's perspective? Uh, yes, he was able to um, form one with Joseph Stalin. And if you think that Donald Trump is worse than jo Joseph Stalin, then I think uh, however much you hate Trump, you've really got to you know, check your prejudices. Um, the fact is, actually, um, the, and the problem really with this whole conversation is that um, the leadership was a wartime leadership. Winston Churchill would not have become prime minister uh, in peacetime. He, uh, it took a world war for the Conservative Party to get behind him after all the uh, mistakes he's made, as, as was mentioned earlier, I think by Paul, crossing the floor of the House not once but twice, would have completely um, prevented him from getting to the top in the way that he did. So, I mean, we, uh, we can talk about Churchillian leadership, but thank God we haven't got a, a global war. Uh, we are at peace, and however bad the trade war gets, it's a trade war. I think that it's very important that we recognize that, um, that you can do things in peacetime if you're prime minister um, uh, that are completely different from wartime and vice versa. I mean, you can't control the media. Uh, it, whereas Winston Churchill was able to do that in wartime and, and famously said that the truth in wartime is so important it needs to be protected by a bodyguard of lies. Uh, well, try that in the uh, time of, uh, of Twitter and Instagram and so on. It's just not going to work. So I think it's very important to see the difference between peacetime and wartime and appreciate that Churchill was a great uh, wartime leader when he was prime minister in peacetime. Uh, he quick, wasn't very good. Sorry. A uh, quick word, Karen, because I then must come to Just, others. Yeah, really quickly. I mean, we're not at war, but we're facing a global pandemic and we're not coming together at all. Now, a, a different, you know, if this were a different American leader, Republican or Democrat, they would pull countries together to pool resources, to share ideas, to come together where possible. The only place that's happening right now is amongst scientists on their own initiative and amongst doctors and others. And it's not happening at all. In fact, if anything, we're all competing the Swedish model versus the British model versus the Italian model. So we are in a global pandemic and we're all completely atomized right now. Thank you. Uh, gloomy set of thoughts. Alan Packwood, not gloomy. You've got some thoughts, some questions from the listening audience around the world. Thousands of people. I do indeed, Jonathan. We've um, only got a very short time and happily. Okay. Um, well, let me launch straight in in that case. Um, and the first question, which is from William in Dorset, really builds, I think, on, on some of the things that you've just been discussing um, and Churchill's willingness to em embrace Stalin. Um, so the question is, given Churchill's preparedness to build effective alliances to reflect the demands of his time, Will the Five Eyes intelligence partners be equally bold and are, will they be prepared to expand their membership? And I suppose, if so, what would that expansion be? Who's, who's the right? Who would like to come in first? Now? Chris, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, we're already seeing the Five Eyes going beyond intelligence, actually, and taking in a number of other issues. Um, I'm talking about, again, this framework of maritime democracies. If you go into Asia at the moment, you'll see that uh, Japan, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand uh, have formed the Quad with India. Uh, so you've almost got a, a, an arrangement there amongst these Anglosphere type countries, uh, democracies operating. So I think the Five Eyes will expand probably uh, to take in intelligence, but also to take in other roles which actually form this maritime democratic bloc. And you'll see it solidify, I think, uh, in order to contain the challenge from China in future. Alan, next thought, question. Okay, so next question, and I think this is probably for all the panelists, um, is do the panel think that um, 
Churchill's fame and relevance will decline when living memory of his era in the Second World War has gone in around 20, 30 years time. And of course, that that living memory is already um, declining as, as, as we speak today. So do the panel think that Churchill's fame and relevance will decline? If they do, I suppose, the, the related question is, um, what can be done to maintain that, that, that relevance? Two questions in, in one. Paul, the I Churchill's it, fame relevance, will it decline inevitably? And what, if anything, can should be done to prevent that? I think we have uh, an archive uh, that the study of which is of increasing global relevance. And one of my challenges and one of the challenges for the trustees is to share that globally and to give global access to it because it's an archive that speaks not just into an individual man, but into the circumstances which he found himself and the complexities that face any form of political leadership today as much as they did in his time. So the concept of leadership, of historical understanding, uh, that's always going to be relevant. And so long as that's relevant, Churchill will be relevant. However, you know, I don't think we should think that his reputation is somehow something that is fixed or uh, will, will ever be unchallenged. I mean, if, if you actually look um, at polls about Great Britain's uh, great uh, uh, world world icons. It's very interesting that all, uh, it, in a BBC TV poll not so long ago, whilst Churchill was chosen by the panel of experts to be amongst the four great global leaders of the 20th century, when it came to the public vote, he actually lost out to Nelson Mandela. Do you follow me? So we shouldn't be overly exercised uh, uh, about that, we should just recognize that that's, that is an inevitability. But what we do need to hold on to is that which is precious, which is that which is contained in the archive, that is which is contained in the values and the skill set uh, that the man possessed, which however complex and however flawed are still of value today. Perhaps, perhaps um, uh, paradoxically, a reputation that is so great that it is contested so many years later is one important way of keeping not only that reputation, but the significance of that person alive. Otherwise, yes. it just drifts into an unobserved past. Um, yes. I don't know. What do you think, Karen? Uh, look, I think it depends on how good our teachers are, our archives, our professors, in keeping people like Winston Churchill alive, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I think it's really important for us all to understand our history much better. And I know there's this whole so-called cancel culture out there. People don't want to learn about anything where there might be anything negative involved with a, a leader. But in fact, we need to understand uh, our past. And I think, you know, look, I'm just stating the obvious right now. So anyway, I think it's our educational institutions that need to really take responsibility. Professor Roberts. Well, 20% of British school children in a recent survey said that Winston Churchill was a fictional character. So I think we've got a, a, a long way to go, actually, before he should be as popular uh, as he deserves to be. I think in 100 years time, he'll still be studied. He'll be like Emperor Hadrian or, uh, or I don't know, Charlemagne. You know, he's going to be one of those historical figures that will always be studied. But the key thing is that we've got to teach him and teach him properly. Another question. Okay, um, Britain is obviously going through a period of sort of transition, quite dramatic change, which has been touched on um, at the moment, um, and that's going to impact on our um, ability to operate on the on the international scene. Um, how should the UK be seeking to use Winston Churchill as a soft power asset? Using Winston Churchill as a soft power asset, you've talked quite a lot about power, uh, Chris, and the need possibly to project power. Um, how would you use Winston Churchill as a soft power asset? You don't generally associate him with soft power, I suppose, it's in relationship, his relationship with the United States. He wrote the history of the English speaking peoples to try and unite uh, 
of the cultures, the United States and Britain. I would say the way that you use Churchill's soft power is to weaponize his example and weaponize his language. Because if you look at Churchill's canon, he reflects the virtues, vices and values uh, of universal mankind in many ways. And he's like Shakespeare. And the point I would make about um, uh, whether we forget Churchill or not, we won't forget Churchill in just the same way we won't forget Shakespeare. There's such variety of human experience in Churchill's life uh, that we'll always be able to mine that experience in the future. But I think his language alone, uh, and I've just recently reread the history of the English speaking peoples, and I defy anybody in this country or even in America or parts of the Commonwealth not to feel proud to be speaking English if they read that book. Andrew? Yes, well, on the day of the coronation, the 1953 coronation, a young American student went up to Churchill as he was crossing Westminster Hall and said uh, and asked him, you know, for some life advice. And I think that uh, that it stands today just as much as ever it did when he said, study history, study history, for therein lies all the secrets of statecraft. And if we're going to weaponize, as uh, Chris so rightly put it, uh, Churchill, the uh, way to do it is by getting people to study history. Have we got some more questions? Paul, do you well, comment on that? Yeah. Uh, weaponizing, not, weaponizing Churchill. I'm not keen on the idea of weaponizing Churchill. I thought you might not be. <laughs> I think the important thing is to recognize that this was a great wordsmith. He didn't win the Nobel Prize for Literature for nothing. He was also a great, I mean, he manipulated and used history for his own, for his own purposes. He always made it clear uh, that he intended to influence how he was seen by actually writing it up. And I think what the great thing that we do in Britain, uh, and I do think this is a soft power asset, is our willingness uh, to uh, hold ourselves up and be prepared to be self-critical. I think uh, uh, we need to do that with, our, with those who are the great amongst us, and Churchill is, is one of those. We shouldn't be afraid of doing that. We should see how our universities, our archives, our great global assets, and we should seek to make them that much more available globally as places where actually freedom matters. Freedom in archives and in universities is precious, and we want to see that expanded. That's the great gift of something like the Churchill Archive. That's a great gift of Churchill College Cambridge and the many other great academic institutions that exist uh, in the UK. And we need to use that as part of our global outreach to the world. I can see why they chose you for the job of chair. Um, um, uh, I think we can squeeze in one more, I think, can't we? Okay. More questions? You, you, you may regret that um, because we're, we're getting a lot of questions about a, um, a rather large area, which has um, just sort of just been touched on by, by the panelists. But that, of course, is the, the relations between Britain and the EU and, 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 and Brexit and, and to what extent um, these recent developments all emerge out of Churchill's legacy of trying to balance um, relations with America, with relations with Europe. Oh my goodness. We all have three or four hours to spare, but we uh, can address it, I'm sure, briefly. Oh, are we able to run over a tiny bit, Alan, to make this possible? Can we run over by one or two? I think we can run over by one or two minutes. Okay, so it, you've got to keep it brief and you could all go on, like any of us could, for quite a long time. Um, I'm going to start, Karen, with you, you look at it, as it were, from the perspective um, of Rusi, but for yourself. Uh, so the, the question is about Europe, America, just balancing all these different players, right? Yeah. I mean, I think overall the values of the Europeans, of the UK, of the United States have been pretty similar, you know, obviously over the last decades. And so I do think there are universal values that these countries all believe in. It. And maybe at times one country believes in them more than others, but certainly respect for human rights, free press, all those issues are common values. And I do think that there's far more in common uh, with UK, with Europe now, and with um, the US than there are issues that divide the three. Churchill's legacy was part of that question. How much of what we now face is Churchill's legacy seeking that balancing act was the question. 
Um, Chris? Mm. Well, I think if we're looking at what Churchill, Churchill would have preferred, there's, uh, Andrew will be able to uh, reinforce this, what um, Churchill said to de Gaulle. He said, if we have to choose between Europe and the deep blue sea, we're going to go for the sea every time. I would say to you today that the world that I've been painting is an Anglosphere world. Uh, and I think that uh, if we manage to unite the values of democracy and the rule of law within that Anglosphere world, we'll actually reproduce something that Churchill wanted. And if you like, it's a modern day non-participatory -particip empire again. And if Churchill were to come back in 10 years time, he'd be very happy at the strength of the Anglosphere world and its friends amongst the maritime democracies. You're looking vaguely quizzical, Paul Boateng. Well, I, we shouldn't forget that in extremis, um, Churchill offered France the prospect of unity with Britain. France rejected it. Uh, we shouldn't forget that. We shouldn't forget either that Churchill was in very many ways one of the architects of the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, that he encouraged the relationship between France, Germany uh, and the establishment uh, of, the, of the European community. But he was always saw Britain as external to that, but having a profound and close relationship relationship with it. We are, we are where we are uh, on Brexit, uh, and we now have to move forward. And in moving forward, we need to have that strength, that courage, that global vision uh, that uh, I think it is something that is part uh, of uh, Churchill's uh, legacy. And we need not to be afraid of being of being global, but we need to build that on values, the values actually in the Atlantic Charter of freedom, self-determination and the rule of law. Andrew? Well, he never wanted Teuton to fight Gaul uh, any longer. His, uh, so many of his friends had died in the First World War and Second World War that, of course, he never wanted that to happen. And he was in favour of Europe uniting. He just didn't think that Britain should be part of that. I think he would be quite shocked as a Democrat at the way in which so many people refuse to accept the democratic will of the majority of the people at the Brexit referendum in June 2016. Um, that wouldn't have pleased him. I think he'd be very excited about the prospect of a new uh, global Britain, just as uh, Paul and, in fact, Chris have been talking about, and uh, being at the heart of something that's uh, going to be rather exciting, in fact, a, a properly independent country. Thank you very much. I would like to continue that view of yours about not accepting the referendum result. It seems to me that one could argue um, quite strongly and with uh, relatively good evidence uh, against your position, which would be that people did accept it, but they did not accept the way in which it was later interpreted. And certainly <laughs> they did everything it possible. Emerged, but we can't they, there, Jonathan, they did everything possible to try and overturn it. You must accept that. The I do, I do not, not accept, doing what the Democrats I do not accept because I don't have to accept I'm just through the chair, as you can tell. Yeah. Anyway, 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 anyway uh, that does bring us virtually to the end of this virtual session. Tomorrow, Saturday, starting at 2 p.m. British summertime, the last hours of British summertime, I think. The Saturday session includes an interview with the American National Security Advisor, Robert O'Brien, presentations from the distinguished historian, Professor David Reynolds, the writer and historian as well, Catherine Katz, and Michael Dobbs, famed among other things for his House of Cards trilogy, which is a political thriller. On both sides of the Atlantic, it's been hugely successful. It had the temerity to suggest that politicians can be murderously venal in their attempts to reach the top. Perish the thought. Thanks very much to our entirely non-venal quartet, Paul Boateng, mm -hmm. Karen Von Hippel, Chris Parry, and Andrew Robertson. Thanks to the organizers of this event and particularly to, for all you around the world watching, I hope you found it as enjoyable as I have done. For me, the only occasionally venal, Jonathan Dimbleby, goodbye. Bye, <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you. It's great, really enjoyed it. <laughs> Jonathan, Thanks a lot. Speaking Thanks a lot, of everyone. Thank you Jonathan, all you very played... much. That was absolutely